Okay, so um, this closed group tutorial was going to be on overbets in theory and practice. So we're going to be discussing overbets, the theory behind overbets, and how to um, use tutorial. overbets in practice, as well as um, some exploitative practice. ways of thinking about overbets. Okay, so, yep, the learning outcomes for this tutorial. So first we're going to talk about why overbetting is important strategically, when it's appropriate to build an overbetting range, and we're also going to discuss situations where we can use overbets um, as an exploitative tool right, to exploit an opponent that is weaker than us and is not expecting us to use overbets and doesn't know how to respond to overbets doesn't know how to respond to a player that knows how to use other bets, etc. So first off, I want to get an idea about what you guys all know. So hopefully you guys can chime in and answer some of these questions that I have up up here. So just um, if you have an answer to one of these questions, just uh, just go for it. Um. What what is an overbet? Uh, well, isn't that already answer in itself? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, why would a player overbet? Uh, because you want to put a lot of money in the pot, and the other player is not going to. Um, or most likely not going to, because their range might be capped or something. Uh, what's the difference? Range advantage, not advantage. Um, range advantage, you have more equity on the flop or turn while any street. Uh, nut advantage, um, I guess that's more important with like bigger stack depth than SPR. Um, nut advantage is like three bet pot, you'll usually have the nut advantage with your over peers, even if your opponent has like a few more like trips than you, for example. Um, why would we overbet? Uh, what's more EV in a lot of spots? Uh, you could bluff more. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, does anyone else have um, an answer to some of these questions? I think, um, well, if I were to look at range advantage over nut advantage, I, I think range advantage. Like in a three bet pot, for example, uh, a three better, um, depending on the flop, you very well have range advantage if he has all the over pairs. Let's say it's um, a board with a lot of low cards. Um, you very well have range advantage in that he has more of the over pairs. Um, however, the caller of the three bet could have nut advantage in that he may have a um, he may have a number of sets. Like let's say the board is. Seven, four, deuce. You could very well have pocket sevens, pocket fours, pocket twos. You could have nut advantage as compared to the uh, three better who could have the over pairs. Okay, so how how do we define the, the two terms, range advantage and nut advantage, and and how are they different? Well, range advantage. Uh, usually, you're gonna be the one with uh, the bet and lead. With the range advantage and uh, nut advantage, uh, uh, I guess you could play. I'm not quite sure. I guess you could play uh, a little more, like more aggressive. Like if someone has a range advantage, but I have a nut advantage, I'd want to check raise more, or maybe like overbet more because I mean their range is strong, so they're probably going to continue. Like to whereas, like I guess, yeah, I think they're. Range is more in the, like uh, inelastic when I like if they have a nut advantage. Yeah, I, I don't know how to explain it. Quite explain it. Um, do you have do you have an explanation? Okay, let's just think about range advantage. What what do people what do people usually mean when they say I have a range advantage? My opponent has a range advantage. This guy has a range advantage, etc. What do they usually mean by that? Like they more equity share in the pot. Like it's like if I have a fifty four to forty five range advantage, then. 
I guess in theory, 55% of the pot's mine. Yeah, uh, so so range advantage can basically be thought of as the average of, of of the of the entire range. Um, sorry, as as the average equity of the entire range. So if we look at our entire range and our opponent's entire range, and we compare the two equities between them, if one player has an equity greater than fifty percent, then they can be said to have the the range advantage. Okay, so if that's range advantage, what what do people say? What do people mean when they say nut advantage? Um, their range, like if the board's a ten jack queen, and I'm the three better, I'm gonna have ace king, and my opponent's most likely not gonna have ace king. So, like I would have the nut advantage, or like trips. Um, if I open the three x pre flop and the big blind calls, I mean we're gonna have way many more aces. Like if we open from the like the hijack to three x and the big blind calls on the ace x board, like we're gonna have well that uh, I guess if it's like ace ace four like ace five five or something, we'll have the sets and um yeah I guess we, that that would be our net advantage as far as the uh, the boats. Yeah, okay, so so th those are all good examples of when one player has an advantage of the other but what do you actually mean when when you say that what do you actually mean when you when you say one player has an advantage over another player um uh, hmm. I, think, I think it just means um if you look at the board um say on the flop if you look at the flop and you look at the action that led to the flop and then in looking at the board you say okay well what what are the nut combos that are possible on this flop and then given the action you can try to determine which player is likely to have those nut combos which one is not and the one that is likely has the nut advantage yeah yeah that's exactly right so g given the action leading up to this point the the player with the more very strong hands in their range. The player with the greater percentage of very strong hands in their range has the nut advantage over the other player. So it is possible to have situations where a player can have quite a large nut advantage but be at a range disadvantage. And vice versa, it can also be possible where a player can have both a range and nut advantage or be at both a range and not disadvantage. Yeah. All right. So yeah. knowing those two different two different definitions, range is sort of the equity of range versus range, and not advantage is who has more nuts in their range. We can think about the other two questions. So first, what is an overbet? I think we I think it's pretty obvious from the definition. The definition of an overbet is a bet that's more than the size of the pot. Okay. So knowing that. We can think about the, the answer to the last question. Why is a player going to overbet? Because they want to capture the most EV from their uh, from their range. Like if uh, if they have the nuts and their opponent has a range advantage, then you want to overbet because they're going to call. Like while they're more likely to call. To whereas if you have a range advantage and a nut advantage. Then um, they're go they're less. I mean, they're not going to call as often because they're aware of their disadvantage with their range. Well, and and also with the uh, the nuts, uh, they'll probably th that just allows them to overfold. To whereas, like, if they had a range advantage, even if we overbet, they have to call or they're being exploited. Like they have to call alpha, I guess, or else. Uh, they're being exploited, so we want to uh, build the pot up with our nuts. Because if we don't overbet, how else are we going to get all the money in? If we bet like pot, and then if we pot on the next street, we're probably still not going to get the money in. So that's why we have to use really big bets sometimes, like especially if our opponent has the range advantage, because then they're more likely to put money in when we have uh, the nuts.
All right, that's um, that's one way of thinking about why why you would overbet. Does anyone else have a way of thinking about um, overbets and maybe tying overbets into expected value? If I have to rephrase the question, how how can we use other bets to increase our EV? Well, we better um, like we're gonna like wouldn't we capture the pop more often if we're betting more? Like if we have uh, like if we're also adding a lot of bluffs. But I, I'm not quite sure because when we bet small, we bet at a high frequency as well. So that's where I'm kind of. I, I kind of really I can't. It's hard for me to get out what I what I want to say. What I'm thinking. <laughs> so I mean, we bet at a higher okay. frequency when we bet smaller, but when we bet bigger, I mean, we're more polarized. Um, yep. All right. So polarity is a good word to use. Um, so to say we're using a polar range in the ter in terms of the hands that we want to bet. Are very very strong. What does what makes us decide between using a small a small bet size with a very very strong value range versus using an over bet size with a bet with the same very strong value range? How do we decide between using those two different sizes? Mm. Well, I think you try to. I think you try to. In, in that try to get an understanding as to what your opponent's likely um, calling or bluff catching range is. And if you feel that range is sufficiently strong enough, the bluff catching range, then you want to target that top end of the bluff catching range and overbetting um, captures the most EV. I mean, wouldn't that be the only way to? I mean, I mean, you gotta. I mean, if you're trying to get stacks, and you can't really, can't really be bent small. Um, uh, yeah, okay, uh, that's one way to think about it. If if we have a very very strong hand, how and why does overbetting increase our EV over betting a small size? What, why uh, is using an overbet? They have to, I mean, they have to call or else they're going to be exploited. And when they call, they're going to lose more than when you bet a, than when you bet a small amount. But then, I mean, that, I mean, that kind of is the same thing as if you bet small and they fold anyways, like if they fold too much anyways. Um, okay. So if we use, say, for example, um, and these spots don't exist very often, but if we use a perfectly polar range where we're betting with value hands which have 100% equity and bluffs which have 0% equity, how does using an overbet increase REV? Um, like if we're, you're talking about if we're like Perfectly polarized. Yep. So say we're perfectly polarized. If we're in a perfectly polarized spot, how does using an overbet increase REV over using a smaller bet? Well, hmm. uh, uh, I mean, don't you? I'm trying to think. Um, hmm. Yep. So, so the answer is it it lets us bluff more often. So, using an overbet lets us bluff more often, right? Because overbetting has a higher bluff to value ratio. And if we're perfectly polarized, whenever we bet, our opponent has an EV of zero because they're indifferent to calling our bet. And so, if we have a higher bluff to value ratio. It just means that we can bluff more often and we can bet more often in total. And so we capture more of the pot more often 
when we use another bet because we're betting more often. Our bluff hands will have an EV close to zero, but our nutted hands will have a much higher EV using an overbet than if we use a smaller bet. Does that make sense? Yeah. What well, wasn't that answer given a couple of times? <laughs> so no one talked about bluff to value ratios, and I think that's that's the important thing. Using an overbet yeah, can, allows us to bluff more often. Yes, I said that a couple times. Someone else said that too, often, I think. Other people have an EV closer to zero. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're thinking if we're not perfectly polar, right? If we're not perfectly polar and we're on a street, let's say we're on a street like the flop or the turn or the river, right? So say we're on we're on the turn. What what makes a good overbet bluff if we're on on the turn, for example? Um, like hands with good uh, robust equity, because the bigger we bet, uh. Like we want our hit bluffs to retain their equity well, because the bigger we bet, uh, the stronger our opponent's range, continuing range is going to be. So if we bet big with weak bluffs, uh, then or if we overbet big with like um, a small flush, then uh, our we're forcing our opponent just to call with like the nut flush draw or combo draws, or like just basically flushes that are going to dominate us. So when we do hit. Um, and they make a flush with us. I mean, we're going to be behind if we don't have good, uh, like if we're not over bet bluffing with mostly like nut flush draws or like big draws with a lot, like with more equity. Yep. Yeah, okay. So that's that's basically correct. When when we're deciding on a hand to use as an over bet bluff, we want our bluff to have the ability to outdraw our opponents calling range against our overbet. Yeah, and their calling range is going to be strong. Why well, Their calling range better be strong because, well, it has to be strong because we're betting big. So, I mean, the bigger we bet, the stronger our opponent's range is. Yeah, that's exactly right. So say, for example, we're on the turn and we decide to overbet and we know that if we overbet, our, opinion, our opponent is going to continue with hands like top pair and not so much weaker then our overbet bluffs have to have the ability to outdraw a top pair hand. Yep. Or at least should. We shouldn't really be overbetting with um, just air. Word. Hey, I have a... Uh, Thomas, I have a um, question. So when we have, like, let's just say... Um, we're just well hopefully this is just a quick answer like like if we're using just let's say just two different bet sizes let's say we, uh, an over bet size and a regular bet size um we still we definitely still want to keep like some of those nut flushes and combo jaws in the uh the second bet size too like just for like just for balance and purposes right like just so we're not um you like you know what i mean like if i'm betting a uh, half pot on the turn I should have some nut flush draws as well, but most likely, most of them should still go into the overbet range if that's a good overbet uh, situation, right? Yeah, that, that's that's correct. If you if you're splitting sizes between a small bet size and an overbet size, your your bluffs, your stronger bluffs should more often be in the overbet size, but they, they should still be in the smaller bet size just in case your opponent decides to. Um, um, okay. Yeah, that's why I get confused Over sometimes. When, when the turn completes the draw, um, or the next three completes the draw. Yeah, because I get a little... Okay, so, when I, oh, never mind, never mind. All right, so moving on to the next question. When should we ever bet? Do you guys know of any spots where it's important to um, think about overbetting? Um, when they're... Well, obviously, I mean, if they're capped. Um, and also the way we bet on the flop like if we bet uh for example like paired boards if we bet like a quarter pot and they just call which they should be raising like a lot uh their range is going to be really weak 
so I, well, I guess that's the same the same thing as capped, but like based on our flop action or based on um like just the fact that when we get to a certain turn card, the range is gonna be too weak. Well, yeah, mostly like the flop, a lot of like flop actions and turn actions just lead them to having a capped range. And I mean, most of the time, our opponent's range, well, I don't know most of the time, but a lot of the times our opponent's range shouldn't be capped if, uh, I guess, if they're playing right, they should have, um, I mean, some turn cards, some turns are going to come to where, like, maybe three or four different, maybe 12 different turn cards will come to where an opponent can effectively overbet, but Sometimes I guess it, I don't think that's quite a problem as long as like most of the turn cards um, can keep someone's range uh, relatively like can keep their range strong. Okay, so you listed one example of a spot where we should overbet, which was if we continuation bet the flop, and then the turn comes a brick. Yeah. Or I mean, it could come any uh, it could come any card if um well not I don't know about any card but like on the low pit like on the paired boards if we bet small and they don't raise then um when the turn comes no matter what the turn is uh, they shouldn't really have trips if they just flat it I mean they could have I guess a few trips but on boards well, like that they should usually have trips there. Um... The, okay, so the difference there is if on, on, on say, a paired flop and we're continuation bet and an overcard comes, we have to think about the difference between range, advantage, and not advantage. Often yeah. when an overcard comes... I think we go smaller there. Yeah, so often when an overcard comes, we go smaller because in that spot we have a range advantage. And even if we do have a not advantage in terms of we have more trips than our opponent, um, we can use a smaller bet size there to press our range advantage. Should should we still have a small over bet range there with our uh, trips or well it might not be necessary because because we have a yeah. range advantage we want to protect our small betting range um a small size betting range using all of our trips just in case our opponent decides to raise okay um, yeah. we'll have trips in that range. Yeah so the is. the in general, when when we should overbet, we should overbet. Should look to overbet in spots where we have a clear nut advantage, and it doesn't matter so much about our range advantage. Okay, so on a turn where our range advantage matters a lot, we're going to want to use a small bet size and leave our our, our um our overbet to the next street when we have a nut advantage. And that's uh, is that always or just like almost always or just in practice always? That's pretty much like, the the way you should think about it. It's when okay. you have a nut advantage. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And you want to you want to overbet those nuts, those nutted hands, and those those uh, those nutted hands don't have to worry about um, protecting another bet size. Okay? okay. So if we have a if we have a range advantage like that, and we want to use a small bet size. If the yeah, ace so say, comes, say we bet and an ace comes, use some over we suddenly theory. have... No, like when, when an ace bit. comes, we have a range advantage. Well, mm -hmm. maybe you can use a little bit. When an ace comes, we just have a range advantage because we yeah. were we would have been bluffing a lot of a lot of those aces. And because cool. we have cool. a range advantage, we want to use a small bet size to get... To capture. ...with those weaker new top pair hands, right? Yeah, because we get bet more then, well, at a higher frequency, right? And because we're using a smaller bet size, our opponent's going to raise a lot. Uh, and so they're, they're, because they're, they're raising they're, a lot, we win more EV by using by putting uh, strong hands into that small bet size rather than over betting them in a separate size. Yeah, that's okay. That's what I. Yeah, okay. That's what wasn't in the front of my head. But yeah, I was just um, yeah, I was just doing that because I had a hand I posted earlier, the king three with the flush draw. It was like a high, big flush draw in. I just decided to. I used like a random generator. I just decided to uh, check that back. But uh, yeah, you definitely want to be almost always betting the strong hands. But um, yeah, that makes perfect sense because th then they get to raise. 
but you don't think maybe like if we use a random generate number generator like if it's one one through five like do you think we can uh throw in an over bet or no uh, it's like one out of 100 if it's one through five could we throw it in um i'm not sure which one you're talking about um, well like in general like the board like you said if the king came like if the over card came and like almost all of our range like should bet small like if i have a random number generator like it's one out of a hundred. Like if I do, if it lands one through five, which is only five percent, could I overbet there, or is that like not? Is that pointless? Um, it doesn't make too much sense to overbet without any rum or reason, just because the just because the random number generator had like that one in twenty. I don't think it makes much much sense. Oh yeah, when, yeah, yeah, when sure. you overbet, you have to think about why you're overbetting. So the spots that we should overbet is when is when we want to press a nut advantage. And we don't have, and we don't care too much about our range advantage. Um, yeah, and you explained it crystal. Like, yeah, I hope you don't think I don't get it all. No, you explain, you explained it crystal clear a few times. <laughs> okay, so, knowing that, can you think of some spots in the tree where overbetting will be used? So the first one we have is we continue to bet the turn, and the river comes a brick. We would often use overbets to continue with our strong hands. Can you think of any other examples of when overbetting can be used quite commonly? Oh yeah, uh, the flop uh, to deny equity, like low boards, um, with our over with some of our over pairs, like nines through jacks. Well, I mean, it it could be other over pairs, um, and then uh, other flops like um, let's say button versus big blind, three, five, six, uh, f uh, monotone. Some top pair hands might want to bet big. Like top pair, top kicker. Um, yeah, I would just like just top pair, top kicker. I probably wouldn't over bet with like top pair, third kicker there. But just to, to deny a lot of equity. Um, yeah, I mean to charge those hands because if if our opponent's range is full of a lot of um, high equity hands, even if those hands suck, I mean if those hands have a lot of equity against our specific hand, then. Uh, I think we capture our range. We capture more EV if we have, uh, like on the flop, if we use two different bet sizes, for example, like our default bet size and then uh, for a specific hand, like on an eight, six, three board or something with like nines. Like if they have a lot of over pairs, like 10 jack, ace, 10, king, queen, stuff like that, over cards. Yep, so that's another example. Um, we're not going to talk too much about the flop in this lecture, but oh, sorry, sorry uh, in, this, in this tutorial, but um, yeah, but overbetting on the flop is is a useful tool on certain on certain I flops low frequencies, in, I guess, in, 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 um, positions, right? So, in a single raised pot, the sack to pot ratio is very large, and often you have to use overbets. This was discussed earlier. Often we have to use overbets to get all the money in. But on certain that's, flops, that's say we're in a position of button versus big blind, we raise pre flop and we get a call by the big blind, and the flop comes low and ragged. On on these flops, what you said was that the over cards will often have a lot of equity against our specific hand, say an over pair. But sorry, where was I going with this? Um, yeah, so these other cards will have a lot of um, equity against our specific hand. So when we decide to use an overbet range, we can put over pairs into that over overbet range um, purely to deny equity from these over card type hands. And it on these specific flops, a low rag flop defines our opponent's range to a top pair, middle pair, bottom pair type type range without too much else to worry about. So going into the turn, we know that even if the turn brings an overcard, because we've overbet the flop, we know that our opponent doesn't have very many of that overcard. So we can still continuation bet the next street with an overpair, with a low overpair. Say, for example, the flop was... Eight four two, where 
we're in the button versus the big blind. We can overbet pocket nines there and fold out the majority of our opponent's overcards. Then when the overcard comes something like a queen, we can still bet the turn with the pocket nines, knowing that our opponent hasn't hit the queen very often. Would that be with the um? I can't find the network connection. Oh, shut up. Would that be with the um? Usually a half pot bet, or uh, would we still? Because I noticed some spots we go pot and then we check back the turn. Do we check back the river? Yeah, potting and check back, and checking back the river is a, is definitely a good line to use there. But what, what's the difference between betting half pot with most of our range, and then like I guess do we bet pot again with that specific hand since we want to um. Well, it, yeah, like sometimes I'm a little confused, like when I'm actually playing like uh, multiple tables to where like if I'm usually playing one or two, I'm fine for the most part. But once I have three or four tables, I have a tough time like because uh, I had a hand like that before while well, like yesterday where I bet and then checked back. But I wasn't quite sure what hands I would want to bet half pot with like exactly. In that spot, like, do you know, it's like. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure which spot you're talking about. Well, I guess not. Never mind. I guess not since we're specifically, since we overbet the flop. So, yeah, never mind. Thomas, I, I okay, got a question. So moving... Sorry. Yeah, if you have a question. Um, yeah, I got, I got a question. Just going back to the uh, ace for example, um, button versus big blind. Um, so the button bet... Um, and then you mentioned, like, if an overcard comes, it could make sense to have an overbetting uh, range there. Um, no, no, no. Um, it's, it's, we overbet the flop. Our opponent doesn't have any other cards left. So if another card comes on the turn, we can still bet uh, an overpair to the flop. Um, so we can still bet nines. But what, we know that would the size and, what would the size and be there? Or after, is that too after, specific? Okay. So this is after overbetting the flop, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't going to talk about flop over bets, but since we're we're on the topic, I'll bring up. Oh, okay. okay. I'll bring up that simulation. Um, and this simulation isn't perfect, but because it's one which I did a while ago. Um, but here we can have a look at this one. Um. So this was just a simulation between um, big blind versus button, and the three sizes which I've gone for this simulation is one third pot, pot, and three times a pot. Um, and here on the 8-4 deuce rainbow board, we can see that pocket nines is bet for three times a pot basically all the time. Similarly, pocket tens um, and, and jacks. So these other pairs. Did you say can three times? Three. <laughs> yep. Um, I can't wait to do that live. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it's, it's only on like these sorts of boards, like a low rag board um, where the top card is like. Um, like 10 or like, lower, usually? Like 10 or lower, yeah. Um, actually, sometimes sometimes on a jack um, as well. Um, the the thing with these boards is that these boards have a lot of like straight draws um, that you have to worry about as well as overcards. So that just that's uh, just more reason why we're bet we're overbetting like the nines here. Like the the reason we're overbetting the nines is because we can to get value out of a pair, and it's also to deny equity from like all the draws. So when we overbet, an opponent decides to continue like. All of their draws has to follow right. All the gut shots have a really hard time continuing. All of the overcards um, have just like they just have a really hard time continuing, right? Like, are you are you really going to have a lot of fun calling a three x pot over bet on the flop with like king high? Um, not really, but you kind of have to do otherwise on certain turns. It, it's um, and that's with the backdoor flush draw only, right? Yeah, yeah. So then we can have a look at what happens um, on like a turn queen, right? When we have the pocket nines, we can still follow up with with the nines there. What's the size? Right, in? because this is um pot, right? Oh, another queen pot. Comes, we, we we pot basically our entire range. We see that, that nines at the bottom, and then yeah, check it back on the river, right? Oh. So we can still pot it because um, and then we pot it to get value out of the Just um okay, top cool. pair, um sorry the the um middle pair at this stage the the eight x hands in our opponent's range which they had a lot of on the flop when they called and then we check back the river one example um i wasn't going to talk too much about that um Sorry. because it, it'll get a bit it'll get a bit more complicated so um you can use overbets on certain flop textures to deny equity 
and then um, with other pairs to deny equity, right? So um, it's a combination of both deny equity and um, yeah, so I can check the EV difference, right? So here the EV of betting three times the pot is 6.15 with the, with the pocket nines and the EV of betting half the pot is 6.04. So the difference between the two is um, roughly a tenth of the big blind or 10 BB per 100, 11 BB per 100 hands. That sounds pretty um, big. So it, it is quite a, a difference. So it is, it, it is important to know these kinds of spots, but these kinds of spots don't happen very often. Um, so, yeah, because the eighth yeah. high board flops comes what, like a fifteen percent of the time or twenty percent of the time or some shit. Yeah, eight high or lower doesn't come too often, but it, it's mainly um, the eight high and it's ragged. And then um, I might, I'm going to have when I go through and talk about um, rag flops between. Um, the, the button and the big line. I'll definitely um, talk a few about a few of those um, flops where we have um, over bets on the flop. Okay, so besides flop over bets, and then we talked about turn over bets after we bet the flop um, as a continuation bet, and then the turn comes a brick. So that's another spot where we should over bet. Does anyone else think I know of any spots where we should over bet? This, what, the river? <laughs> Okay, on the river. In which situations would you ever bet on the river? Um, well, when we... Well, I guess our our size is going to determine... I mean, their continuing range. So if we go so high to where they're not going to have any hands that can call, I think that's bad. So I guess we should have an overbet range to where they can still call. Like, I mean, uh, an overbet size to where... They can we can still pinpoint like some combos in their range that has to call. Um, yeah, well, if you get to the river and you just shove, then your opponent still has to call some of the time in order to make your bluffs indifferent. So, well, can't we bet so big that they never call? Well, no, I guess they would still. Have no, they still have to call. They still have to find. They still have to find a call some of the time. <laughs> um, otherwise, your bluffs always win the pot, right? So if your opponent yeah. never calls, like say, um, you get to you get to the river, and then the SBR is like five, and you know that your opponent's range has um, no hands in it that can call your five x pot over bet on the river, then you should basically over bet five x pot with any with any hand which. Um, you you think has EV less than less than the size of the pot because when you shove five times a pot they're always folding so EV is one EV is is the entire pot and so any hand which you think has EV less than that you should shove so which is which is which will end up being like a lot right so um, that's a, a that's a way of thinking about it you can also think about how often your opponent is going to call right so if your opponent has calls. If they're playing well, they should have some calls against even very large overbets. So, yep, uh, the river is is one of the is one of the spots where we can use overbets. The river is the last street, so we don't have another street to follow up on if we have a very strong hand. So that basically means that if we want our value, we have to get it now, kind of thing. Does anyone have any other spots where overbetting is would be useful strategically? Having an overbet range would be useful strategically. Um, if uh, guess if they fold well, if they. Fold, uh, I guess if they fold too much, right? Like, because then we can. Uh, yep. So then, then folding too much is we just, just trying to more. exploit. We just bluff. We're just trying to exploit someone, right? So if we know that our opponent just isn't going to fold, I'm um, sorry, just isn't going to call enough, 
um, to stop us from over bit bluffing them, then we should over bit bluff a lot. To balance our uh, so that's, yeah, to balance that's an exploit. strong hand. No, that's um, that's not going to do with balance. That's pure purely exploitative. If we once again right, so if well, I mean, shouldn't we have? We uh, I mean, shouldn't we still have our well, our strong hands, right? Like a lot of them, so we could bluff a lot, right? Or like yep, a big so bet. when we're thinking about exploits, we don't have to worry as much about um, GTO and being balanced. So if we know that our opponent is going to fold a lot to an overbet, say we overbet twice the pot, then our opponent has to continue roughly a third of the time in order to stop us from, from profitably bluffing them. But if our opponent decides to only continue like 10% of the time, then when we do bluff, we win the pot. If, when we do bluff with an overbet, with 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 a with an overbet we do overbet bluff we win the pot um you just win it more often you just win the pot way more often than you should and so all of our bluffs are massively plus ev against a player that is folding that often against an overbet so yeah as, as an exploit that's the, the the last question on on this page um as an exploit against players that will fold a lot to an overbet we can overbet bluff them a lot. So does anyone um so does anyone know any more exploits to use overbets? Using overbet as an exploitative tool or any other spots where we should be overbetting um just against even very strong players. Um I know there's another spot I'm trying to think of, like on the turn. Um, uh, there's another spot I was trying to think about on the turn. Uh, it's like on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> oh, I'm so beat right now. <laughs> okay, so we discussed some for the in-position player. Are there any spots for the out-of-position player when, when you should use an overbet? As an exploiter, just like like from GTO. Uh, in GTO. Um, I think maybe if um, if you're out of position, um, you bet the pot on a fairly dynamic board, and you get a call from the in position player, and then the turn card is um, doesn't really improve any of the hands in either player's range, then um, the out of position player probably has a good opportunity to overbet there because the uh, imposition player um, has demonstrated his range is somewhat capped and that that turn card doesn't really help him much. Yep, so that's exactly right. Um, when, when we're the out of position caller of the, um, or even if we're the, the, the RFI, spots where the imposition player chooses Alex not to bet and then the turn comes essentially a brick for their range, we can use other bets with our nutted hands against them. So that's definitely a spot. Um, the other bet turn probe, um, which is one of the spots that we're going to discuss. OK, um, does anyone have any more exploits using other bets as an exploit against a weak opponent? Can anyone think of any other bet exploits to use? Um, if, um, as an exploit, um, I guess if a draw comes in, like if a draw completes, that's in our range, but not theirs. All right, just think really face up really superficially. So we discussed if our opponent folds too much against the other bet, we're going to bluff a lot. What if our opponent is going to call too much? No? So if our opponent is going to call too much against an overbet, then 
we're not going to bluff them and we're going to use more value in our overbet range. So we're going to overbet thinner for value and we're going to bluff a lot less. Sorry about that. My, uh, my laptop died for a second there. Uh, did I miss Did I miss anything? Yep, so we're just going over if our opponent calls too much for an overbet, then what we're going to do is we're going to overbet less often as a bluff and far more often for value. And we're also going to overbet thinner for value. Okay, yeah, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Okay, so those are the two, the two um, main exploits. What about, um, those are the two main obvious exploits. What about range-based exploits? When we'll use overbets to exploit a player that has problems building their range correctly. You mean them them having problems based on our size, and or just them having problems because uh, they don't know they don't know how to go about it? Say, um, I, I want to try and ask, ask the question without giving away the answer. <laughs> um, say, we have an opponent that. They say have we have, to, say um, we have an opponent that never bluffs the flop, then what are we going to do on the turn? If they never bluff the flop, yeah. Do you you talking about like if they were the pre-flop raiser and then they see bet, but it, it was never bluffs? Yeah. So if if they see bet, if they see bet, those those see bets are never bluffs. What are we going to do if they check back, and we see a turn? Or shouldn't we? Oh, are you serious? Well, you can obviously bet um, if they're always checking back weekends, but you don't necessarily need to overbet. Yep. What what's what's the deciding what's the decision between using the overbet and not using the overbet? So obviously, if they're if they're not bluffing the flop, then their checkback range is going to be and it's going to have more weaker hands in it because those weak, weaker hands weren't used as a bet on the flop. So the checkback range is going to have more weaker hands in it. What is the deciding factor between whether or not we want to overbet? If, um, yeah, my dog went crazy. If um, we have, well, we'll have the, Tell me if we have the nut, so like if we have the nut advantage, I mean, what don't we want? Yeah. So if if we have the nut advantage, that, that's that's the, that's one of the main things, right? The the question then is, if they might not be bluffing the flop, but are they using all of their strong hands on the flop? So against a player that's using all of their strong hands on the flop, when they check, they're very very capped, and so we can use over bets with our strong hands. A lot thinner yeah, than than normally we, we we would normally be able to do. Yeah, that's like a like if we if we uh, <laughs> shut up. That's like if we bet. Um, oh my gosh! Like if. <laughs> if, if... All right. Does anyone else, does anyone else have have any questions about what, what we discussed in the last two slides? Okay, what, what, what I was going to say is if we check out a position on the flop and we notice our opponent, say the board's uh, king four, king six four, and we notice our opponent bets um, king jack or like king ten, king jack, and king queen. So if they bet king, if we see them bet king jack, it's showdown in that situation. And once we see them in the next situation, similar to that, and we see them check back, I mean, we know that. They would for that bet size, like they would usually bet uh, king ten, so they're capped at they would be capped at like a, a weak king. So then we can overbet uh, king ten or better, since that's the hand we might check call out of position on the flop. 
Yep, exactly right. So when they check back, they're very capped and you can overbet a lot thinner. All right. Um, so do you have any questions about what we've discussed over the past couple of slides? Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a question. Okay, so when we overbet and face a raise to where it's possible for them to have some good hands like how, how would we react to that for example like if their range is capped if only say three percent of their range is two pair plus like so a real small percentage but they do have some if we face a raise how how do we necessarily do we just um is it still alpha yep so i don't like have a video up on on the math behind defending against the raise but um, the way you think about it, the, the the short short way of thinking about it is you follow all your bluffs, which you would have had a lot of when you're overbetting. So you follow all your bluffs, and then it's just alpha of the raise size. So you you follow your value range, but from the but from the bottom of your value range up, yeah, based yeah. on um, the raise size. So if they raise, if they make a fifty okay. percent pot raise, right? Then yeah. You follow your bluffs, and we use alpha to fold our. Um, Value, Question. Uh, value range. When I'm uh... <laughs> so another way you could do it is you just calculate what they're risking in total and how much they are going to win if we fold, and then use that as our folding frequency. So that would be our total folding frequency. And it just turns out that if we're bluffing with a good loss of value ratio and then we face a raise folding at alpha of our value range um, when we bet folding our bluffs and then folding at alpha of our value range is the same as folding our entire range at that risk to reward that that risk to reward ratio that our opponent um our opponent has with their raise yeah that makes sense how how would you um how would you go about like when you're using two bet side, like um, when you're using, since we're only humans, like how do you go about when we use, because I'm trying to work on this now, like when we're splitting our ranges and then we face a raise, um, the combo, like that's so hard, that's hard to do because the combos, like it then comes down to com, like the combos have to be so precise now, like to whereas if we have one bet size, so I could calculate that in my head, like in, in real time. But when I have two, it, it gets, I mean, I can, do it to an extent but it gets a little like the pressure's on <laughs> like what as far as um like for example if i'm betting the turn i have an over bet range but then i also have a pot range and then a half pot range so it's like uh because the bluffs can go in all the ranges like i can have well of course with our over bet range we want the strong the high equity bluffs like our strongest bluffs but we still want to sprinkle some of those into our other uh, betting ranges and then we have like gut shots weak gut shots that can go into like let's say maybe not the over bet range but that can go into the pot range and the half pot range right yep so what's what's the question like how do you go about like when we when you face a raise how can you in real time i like i don't want it to i want to ask how can you simplify but i don't think it's that easy as far as um like when I know I'm on the turn and I have three different bet sizes and I kind of have an idea what hands go in each and I face a raise, how do I quite defend against that raise? Because I'm going to have some strong draws in each of those bet sizes. So I know you said fold all your bluffs, but I mean, I'm going to still want to call with some. Like if I. No, um, when, when I say fold your bluffs, I mean fold your bluffs that you that, that they use that on, on that to. specific street. But. Um, Usually, when you ever bet, you're not going to be facing many raises because you're quite polar. Yeah, and they should be capped for well for a lot of spots. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm fine with uh. When when, when you're working on the the combinatorics, it just it's it's a matter of of counting which combos, and then you you know you know on the flop and on the turn, depending on how you've constructed your range, if it's very polar, then you're just going to re-raise. Right, 
And if you have a flop over bet range, then that's going to happen quite often. Um, if, you, if you continuation bet the, the flop and then you over bet the turn, often the raise size, which they're going to use, is all in anyway. So you just have to call according to um, trying to make their draws indifferent to, to shoving. Yeah. Um, so it'll you'll, you'll be folding a little bit less than than the um, than the alpha calculation. Um, okay. So I guess we'll move on because that's a bit of a bit of a side thing. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is um, over the turn as a probe. So when we're out of position as the the caller preflop. Um, and if we're the call of preflop, then we're usually um, the big blind, and we're in a single raised pot because if we're in a three bet pot, then um, overbetting doesn't make as much sense because if we overbet, we get all in too quickly. In a single raised pot, and the imposition player has checked back. Now we should know that when the imposition player checks back, they're not going to have anywhere near as many of their strong hands as if they had bet because if they had because they're going to be betting most of their strong hands on the flop. And so when they do check, their range is, is very capped. So they might not have um, any sets left after they check back, for example. just So for example, they might not have any sets left. And so this means that on many of these turns, we can use over bets with our node hands like sets to get value out of our, out of our opponent's um, middling hands. Right? Because... Yeah. The top of our range is ahead of the top of our opponent's range, so we can use the majority of the top of our range as an overbet for value, and then we can balance that with bluffs. Okay, and that that's even if uh, because I noticed like a lot of um, because I used to almost always check back top set in pos in position uh as a pre flop raiser, but now I bet it most of the time, and I check back some like bottom sets and some like weaker two pair hands. But that still can uh, my opponent should still overbet because is that still going to be like such a small percentage of hands? Because it's usually like say four combos or three two combos or something. Like they could still yeah, effectively. Yeah, so they, 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 should, they should still overbet because the the percentage of nut hands in your checkback yeah. range isn't isn't very high, okay. right? It's just it's just high and, enough so that it's so that the EV yeah, bad, of checking gosh, back. Right? It's just high enough so that the EV of checking back is the same as the EV of betting. Um, no, it's not necessarily bad for you. Um, so I'll show you guys an, an example. Now, this is the same example as before on the, the 8-4 deuce, except um, the imposition player is checked back and then with a big blind and the turn comes an ace. Right. So most people think that, oh, the ace has come. It's good for your opponent's range. Yes, it's good for our opponent's range, but it doesn't um, bring them too many nod combos. So be just because it's better for our, for our opponent's range, it doesn't mean that it's good for our opponents nuts. So we well, are going to have, yep. Yeah, so we're going to have a, a nut advantage on this turn because they check back, right? They would have bet many of their sets. So when we have a set or a straight, we're going to, or even a, a decent two pair hand, we're going to overbet ourselves to try and get value out of out of an ace, which our opponent would have now. Okay. Should should we um? And the, here, the rest of our rangers use the check, right? Is check raising uh, the two pair with the ace good for us then? Like ace eight, ace four, ace two? Or is that is that doing too much? <laughs> like is that not part of the slide? Um we can have a look at it if you want, but I think the the reason why the aces are checked some of the time is because they block ace X in our opponent's range. Um and so using them as a as a as a as a check and then like when we face a bet um as a raise, using them as a check raise is probably better because um, we're more likely to be facing a bluff. Um, so, like, we can have a look at the the three of a kind there. So, most of the sets and the straights are, are going to be bet. Some of them are going to be check raised. But the the bet size is what's most important. If we look in the top left, where this is a three x pot over bet turn probe, um, when the turn has come an ace, right? Three x. Okay. Yep. Yeah, well, it's just three x because of the simp, but three um, x is an example of what we can do on certain turn cards after our opponent checks back. Okay, cool, cool. What what are we uh, what are we bluffing there with, Thomas? Draws. In, in, in this sim, yeah, just a bunch of draws. So here's the, the opening of straight draws. Um 
these, these gut shots here, right? Hey, uh, Thomas, uh, when you don't have any draws or maybe like a small amount, do we go to uh, like King Jack, King Ten offsuit type hands, like or like like you, or do we go to our uh, like let's say this board had no draws for whatever reason, like would we overbet our nine ten offsuit or like King Queen or King Jack? Do you know what I'm saying? Like if we don't um, it's, really it's have... difficult to find a board with no draws, but you would probably um, find. A draw so you can sort of reclassify some hands um into a draw so like a bottom pair type hand can can be a draw because it's got five outs to to beat top pair um okay a sing yeah, single over sense. card can be thought of as a draw because three outs to top pair okay kind yeah, of stuff cool. right so okay, like we over bet cool. and then we can see that their range shrinks to um a lot of ace x type hands okay so so if, so our weakest pairs basically if we don't have for whatever reason no, not that many um, like our weakest pairs have five outs so we can yeah. five outs against top pair so we, gotcha. we we would use them cool cool um all right so that's overbit turn probes so thinking about overbit turn probes how how can we use an overbit turn probe to um, exploit a weak opponent and we already discussed this probably but um, if our opponent bets too many of their strong hands on the flop when when they do decide to check their range is very capped and so then we can overbet against them mm -hmm. um, other examples pull up another example um, Okay, so here's an example um, from the same database. Um, it's king nine two, and the incision player checks back, um, and then the turn pairs the bottom card, right? So when the turn pairs one of the one of the board cards, often that means that the opposition player can decide to have an overbet range. Here, the hands which overbet three times a pot are mainly a lot of the, a lot of the trips, right? So the three of a kind hands which um, improved by the bottom card pairing um, can now be used in an overbet range. And this is because um, many of, if you look at the preflop ranges here, the button's not going to have many 2x hands and many of the 2x hands would, would have been used on the flop as, as, a, as a bluff, right? So when they check back, they often don't have many 2x hands. And so we can overbet a two to get value from um, other parts of um, our opponent's range. Right, so here they don't have too many twos, um, but they have some kinks which they would have checked back. So, those are a couple of situations where we you'd, we would use another bit turn probe. And if we're exploiting an opponent, say our opponent didn't, say our opponent basically always bet all of their kings, then this basically means on any basically any brick turn we can overbet all of our kings. Okay. So is it safe to say... Is my mic muted? No, okay. So is it safe to say, like, if we see... Uh, so I guess if we see villain go, like, on a king nine four board, if we see them go, um, I guess, king five, is that... Should we um, just assume they go lower than that, or do we try to just cap it at there and then go that or higher? Well, you have to have a pretty good read that, yeah, that's, yeah. that they're, they're always going to be betting king, king five or higher, right? So they, they might just bet <laughs> yeah. it some of the time and check some of the time. Okay. So, so that's you have to really know your panel in order to um, exploit them well enough. Now, if it's live, how do you... Like, this is the de like the debate I have all the time with live. It's like, you just... you Like, it feels like you play with people a lot, but the actual hand you get, you don't really like see too many hands with people live and then like it's a ring so the other players the multi-way pot just dilutes that dynamic you know it's just find it hard to get good like big samples on people like that like as far as extreme exploit like maximum exploitive strategies i just feel like the sample size never gets reached 
Yep, yep. So there's a, there's a bit of an aside, but on, on live, you don't have too many hands against your opponent, right? You're not playing that many hands against them um, compared to online. So all of the reads that you have aren't going to be um, as as solid um, I have, uh, against 50, them. 000, I have 50,000 hands uh, at a certain limit on ACR, and the most hands I have on one single opponent is like 4,500. No, it's like 5,000. Yeah, about five, about probably not even five thousand, and like that's with fifty thousand hands. If that's if that's uh, that limit, and it's only like five thousand hands, and that's only good for like some turns and flops and stuff. So yeah, it just it takes a lot of hands, people. <laughs> yeah, but it takes a lot of hands in order to get your um your reads up to any sort of um level that you can have confidence in them and you're not just making a huge mistake um, yeah. with, with your exploit. Okay. Um, so that's, are you guys happy with Obit Turn Probes or do you want another example? Um, what about, so the paired boards, if it's, um, could you go to um, flesh comp like any flesh completing or straight completing boards I, I guess flesh completing boards would be more interesting yeah often on, on 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 flush completing and straight completing turns there isn't an overbet range because our opponent should be checking back some of their flush and straight draws okay so there, there is an overbet range there because um a lot of people don't this is that. this is probably a teaching a teaching point um it's you have a nut advantage because your opponent bet all their nuts on the on the flop and the turn brings a brick to your opponent's draws. That's when you that's when you overbet because you have an advantage over them. But if the turn completes some of the draws, then you no longer have an advantage, and so you can't really overbet. Okay. Yeah, I got it. So, yeah, that makes perfect yeah perfect sense. So when we have the um, I mean, this has been explained like a dozen times <laughs> at least. So when we have a range advantage. And so when we just have a nut advantage, they have a range advantage. We should go um, like we should overbet with our nuts, of course. Now, how do we go decide whether to? Why? Well, yeah, you already said. Yeah, I guess never mind. Because our we would decide our check raises with hands that block their check back range. So okay, yeah. I don't think I have that question. Um, nah, never mind. Nah. So do we um, ever check raise when we don't block hands in their check back range? Like as far as when we have the nut advantage? Um yeah, Whether usually usually if if usually the best candidates for a check raise would um would yeah, be the ones that block their check backs, but the if you if you don't have any, then you're gonna have to find some just because you need some check raises whenever you check and when you're out of position. Okay. Um, so if you can't find any that block, you just find some that, that do. Anyway, um, does anyone else have any questions about overbet turn probing before the next one? Um, now, uh, the paired board, that's, uh, I guess it goes because the top card, I guess, the what about the middle end card? Because can't they have done a lot of people check back um some pairs like what if there's certain flops where opponents check back most of those pairs then i guess we forego the we then we obviously forego the overbank because they obviously yeah they have some nuts in their hands so yeah i'm all good all right so we're moving on to um overbank overbank as a double barrel so often when we continuation bet the flop um the opposition player is going to check raise many of their strong hands so then when a turn comes a brick um, often this means that uh, both the, uh, the the draws in both players ranges have um, have missed and so because they have missed and because they have missed the nut has the nuts haven't haven't changed okay so we're going to have more nuts in our range than our opponent will because they've raised their nuts on the flop and so we're going to have an advantage over our opponent, but not necessarily a range advantage. Um, in terms of range advantage, our opponent is going to have, um, the opposition player is going to have um, many strong hands in their range, and our, our range will be more polarized to having 
some very strong hands as well as some bluffs. And so we, here we're going to have an advantage, but not a range advantage. And so because we can check back the, the remainder of our of our range, we're going to press an advantage by using an overbet for our second barrel, for our double barrel. And many of the hands that we can we can overbet, we can use an overbet on the turn and then check back the river. So, so don't be afraid to go very thin with a, with a turn overbet with the intention of checking back the river. So not all of our um, overbets when we're in position on the turn have to overbet the river as well, have to shove the river or bet the river as well. They can, they can check back. So I'll see if I can find an example. Yeah, that last uh, the last bullet uh, overbetting the turn and checking the river. Um, are we on to that? I'm sorry, my my dogs barked again for a couple seconds, and I kind of, I paused, I muted my mic. Sorry. Yeah, because I had a spot a couple of days ago. I overbet the turn, and then they shoved on me on the river, <laughs> like I was in position and overbet the turn, and then they shoved the river as an overbet. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Yeah, okay. Well, you should just fold a lot. Um, yeah. That's, that's kind of a weird spot. But I had a... Um, it's just I had top pair, top kicker, so it just felt weird. Like, it was a queen jack board, and I probably shouldn't have... I overbet, like, 1.2x or... one Yeah, 1.2 or 1.3x with top pair, top kicker, because I turned the nut flush draw with ace-queen. It was queen jack, 2-4, two, 2-tone, uh, two and that ace-queen, I bet they called. It was a wet flop, queen jack, 2 with a flush draw, and then... um. The turn came with four diamonds, and I had top here, top kicker, and turned enough flush draw, and I overbet, and the river came an eight. So like a, it was queen jack two four. So eight. they shoved. So they overbet. So they overbet donk shove on a river. River, yeah. Well, it wasn't. I yeah, guess they could yeah. have they could have nine ten of diamonds or nine ten of spades for the straight because the river came the eight. It was an offsuit eight. So it was queen jack four two diamonds on the flop. Well, two cl two spades on the flop, one diamond. Then the four came on the turn to complete a, a flush draw. So it gave me a backdoor nut flush draw. And then uh, um, the river came at eight, which didn't complete any flushes, but they could have nine, ten of spades, nine, ten of diamonds. And they overbet. And like I was like, what the okay, fuck? <laughs> okay, well, um, overbetting when the flush comes in doesn't make. Well, no, no it didn't come in. It was Is... It didn't come in. It was an eight. So oh, they could have, could have called my overbet on the turn with a uh, nine ten of diamonds because that was a turned flush draw, comp while well, turned open ended, a straight flush draw, or they could have uh, already had that on the flop and then hit the straight on the river. This, no flush came in, just the straight could have came in like two combos. They could add two combos possibly with the straight. So well, anyways, I called with ace queen. They had queen jack on the flop, so they had two pair on the flop and they slow played it on the flop and then. I guess they were scared on the turn because I overbet. And then they shoved the river. I was like, really? <laughs> yeah, okay. When, when when that kind of thing happens, you should fold a lot because number one, you should you should fold all of your turn bluffs. Oh yeah. And for then sure. and then um basically basically you're just you're just gonna be folding at alpha. Like you should construct your ranges. Um you're not you're not you know, you should fold at alpha yeah. on top of on top of the the, the bus which you had on the turn, right? Do you so think that your opponent was too thin though for that size because it was like a one point three x, so like it was queen jack, like queen jack four or something, and it was a flush draw on the flop. And I was like, for sure they would probably, you know, raise there because I bet three fourths pot, like seventy percent pot on the flop, and they were out of position. And then the turn came, and I usually don't bet that big with just top pair top kicker. I usually go like pot there with top pair top kicker. But I had to fly. I turned in that flush. There's, there's, not, there's, not, there's not a lot of difference between between pot and 1.3 times a pot. When yeah, when you're right. overbetting, you you, you want to you want to think about spots where you can make make the bet a bit chunky. Otherwise, it's um it's not going to be too different to the strategy which you would use if you're just betting pot. Yeah. Um, but if I went like 1.5, is that even that much of a difference? Yeah, that that's that's getting there. Um, okay. 1.5 is probably. The, the smallest yeah, size, which I would consider like a like a regular sort of overbet, bet, okay. anything smaller than that, because you can round it down to one pot, um, and it's not going to be too different. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not exactly sure 
what what that is because I haven't seen the hand history and haven't had a look a uh, closer look at it. But yeah, I'll post it tomorrow. Usually, donk donk shoves. Usually, donk shoves on on the river after you've ever bet the turn. Uh, absolute just... nonsense. So I don't know what your opponent's trying to do. Anyway, um, <laughs> so overbet double barrels. So we'll move on to overbet double barrels. Um, so here, here's an example. Um, so um, of the, the flop is ragged. So it's queen seven three. Um, we bet half pot on the flop, and then our opponent calls, and then the, the turn is a jack. Um, so this is an example of where we can overbet for twice the pot. Right, so the turn jack um, is an undercard to the queen, but it's basically a, a brick because we don't expect um, um, uh, the jack to improve too many hands in our in our opponent's range. Um, it doesn't improve too many hands in our range either, in terms of it doesn't it doesn't bring um, too many hands which can suddenly beat beat the queen. Right, so the jack doesn't improve a hand to beat the queen. Um, should they should they be raising there a lot on the flop? Well, not raising a lot, but should they have a raising range? Is like is our flop size small enough, or like are we betting at a high a big frequency on this flop? Okay, so we go back to the flop. So we're betting quite often on the flop, and then when we bet, they they're raising like eleven percent of the time. Um, anyway, so basically we can see that on the flop, they're they're raising a lot of their sets in two pairs, right? So on on this specific turn card, they're not going to have too many two pairs. Got you. Left, right. So the jack comes; it doesn't improve too much. They they they're going to have some new two pairs, um, <clears throat> where because the jack improves um, queen jack, jack seven, and and jack and jack three, um, but that doesn't make up a huge a part of our opponent's range. And so we when our when we have some a strong hand like ace queen, um, or or king queen, and um, even here we're going as thin as sort of queen ten. We can we can overbet these hands for value, right? Is so, that due to our flop sizing? Like, if we bet a uh, sixty plus percent or seventy percent on the flop, which is I guess which is bad flop size, and then we wouldn't do this, would we? Um, the sizing on on this sort of board is probably going to be on on the on the smaller side. In the sim, I don't have a, a size smaller than this. Smaller I mean, than if we, half pot. If but... we were to go, if we were to see bet big, like say on say we misclicked and bet a three fourths pot, then like wouldn't their range would their range be then too strong to consider? Uh, uh, no, I, I don't think there's there's going to be too much difference between when you're betting half pot and and three and three quarters pot um, to the to the decision of whether or not you should ever bet on this turn. Right, okay. this turn is is basically uh, um, both you players. Know, you don't see too many both people over ranges, right? It, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Okay, well, yeah, that makes um, sense. it depends who you're playing against. If you're playing against very strong players, then when they oh, see yeah, yeah. a brick, a brick on the turn, then they're gonna overbet their strong hands um, yeah. for value, right? And so, um, notice that the hands that we're using as another bet bluff, right? So we're giving up on like um, these uh, these sort of weaker hands, and we're using hands which have good equity against a queen, right? So we're using like an ace king. Right, it can it has six outs to draw to a pair to beat a queen, and it also has additional four outs to draw to the straight. Um, other than that, like we're using a king five, right? It's got three outs to beat a queen, right? Or like an ace, ace deuce. It's got three outs to beat a queen. So, um, th those those kinds of hands which we're using um, as are What's that overbet size? Our overbet twice bet. Pot. Yeah, this is a twice pot overbet size. Um, so we're using these, these very strong draws, we can see some of our very strong draws. We can see that a lot of our um, hands with a single overcard uh, are being used the as same. well. And that's just the same, even if a backdoor flush draw comes in, we'll just use our flushes then? So if we change well, to... Draws, um, I mean. Uh, use our flush draws. If it's a club, then yeah, well, the flush draws are going to be better as well, right? Okay. Especially flush draws with an overcut. It, 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 you can see that it doesn't change too much. We're still, we still have an overbet range when the flush comes in. Okay. And I think do we're we take some more often. So, like, do we take some of those the, the, the brick away? and the overcut? Not... Okay. So, like, if a jack of spades <laughs> comes in, do we take away some of our, those uh, three out overcards, or we're still betting most of them, even if a 
even if our draws, even if we get draws, you know. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure what you meant. No, I mean, like, so say a jack of spades comes in, and now we have uh, flush draws in our range. Are we still going to use most of those uh, three outers, like those king highs, ace highs? Uh, yeah, but we're going to pre prefer if it has a flush draw as well, right? So all of our flush draws are going to be bet. Uh, um, right, so we're still, that, still... It doesn't still knock out. Quite a bit. Okay, um, like... Did someone well, else have a well, question? Well, I, I heard someone speak up there. Uh, yeah, Tom, so I just had a question on the... Um... The big blind. Um, he's raising his um, his strong hands on the flop. So is, is, is he raising all of them, or most of them, or some of them? Like the sets of sevens and threes and queen seven. Yeah, most of them. So all the sets are being raised. Right, and so most of the two pairs. And this is and this is despite the fact that we that we are overbetting the turn. Oh, everybody made these big turns. So yeah, that, that kind of there's not a lot our opponent can there's not a lot our opponent can, can do to prevent us from overbetting a brick turn after we see it at the flop. Right. Um if they if they want to to try and um trap with a set, it's just going to reduce their um EV by by a bit um when when they do have a set. Um, notice like how often we're checking back. We're checking back more than half the time um, when the rick comes, and that's half the time that our opponent doesn't get value when they have a set here, right? So even if even if the, the turn come, does come a brick, we're overbetting a lot, but also checking back a lot, and so those two together means that we um, do too much on the flop in terms of trapping. To prevent us from from betting without them losing quite a bit of EV. Yeah, that makes sense. So, are you seeing this a lot in your games, Thomas and um, Michael? Um, you know, well, raising, on dry, raising on dry flops like this. I mean, I'm I'm usually well. I mean, some of my like when I play uh, when I shot take like because I play on ACR. So I mean, I don't. Those players are kind of tight, but when uh, like they're ge the general player point ACR is tight since they have like rake back and rake races. But uh, when I play 400 now, which I only played like 30, 40,000 hands, like I, I see that. But even at 200 now and lower, not too often. But yeah, the point still being like you still like Thomas, like you still got to you just got to assume your opponent's playing strong until they're weak, I guess, you know. I yeah, guess um, that's the smart that's the smart way to go. That's the smart way to go, sorry, buddy. Sorry. So George, your, your, your question is um, whether players should be raising the flop with the strong hands? Is, is that what you're saying? Whether these players should be having yeah, a raising no, I guess, on the flop? I guess, um, I guess if I'm, it happens a lot in our games. Yeah, I guess I guess I'm I'm you know, progressing in my mindset about, about about the game is that typically I um I've always assumed that these type of strong hands um when out of position you you want to raise them on the flop when the flop's a bit more dynamic. And I'm I'm looking at this flop here and I don't really see too much happening. Now well, I see your point you want to build a our flop frequency. Yeah, we're c betting a lot. Like our opponents, like on this queen seven three, the frequency of c bettings. Uh, like you're c betting a lot on this board, so you're not going to be able to call with like. I, I don't. Well, I'm not sure if I'm correct, but like against half pot, you got to defend. I mean, you know. Yeah. So so c, so c betting the flop is um is sorry. So check raising the flop. On the big line, it, it's important to do that because it it's a way of preventing your opponent from betting the flop and then checking back the turn. So if if you never check raise the flop, so on on this specific board, if if you node lock the out of position player to never raise, right? If you just remove the, the raising line from the out of position players, you check back, uh, don't you? Um, I can guarantee I can guarantee you that the the solver would go from an eighty percent <laughs> c betting to a hundred percent c betting frequency. And then check back mm. the turn a lot. Mm. Okay, so like um, when you have a strong hand, even on a flop which like this, which looks pretty dry, even though it sort of isn't because it's still got like overcards, which can beat like, a, a, like an ace can always turn and beat a queen, and an ace is going to happen um, three out of forty. How many cards are there now? Three out of forty-five. What's that of of the time, etc. Um, 
and then you'll, there's also, there's also um, a bunch of draws in between the seven and the three, right? Right. D does that answer your question? So th the way to exploit a player that this is this is a side, uh, an aside. The way to exploit a player that isn't raising their strong hands on the flop is to see bet a lot on the flop and then check back a lot on the turn. Mm. Right, and then if, if they start doing this shit like 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 check calling the flop and then like donking the turn just because they know that you're going to check back a lot, it's kind of like, okay, you let me see the turn for free. Why didn't you not just check raise the flop? At least then I would have to fold and not see the turn. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, so that's an exploit against players that that don't check raise the flop enough. Is to bet see about yep. the flop a lot and then check back the turn a lot, and so um, yeah, they're just yeah. going to lose. Yeah. I know where he's coming from though, because I didn't start check raising these kind of boards until like, honestly, probably like six months ago. <laughs> like, may like maybe a little bit longer, but like I'll say six to nine months. Like I'll say twelve months ago, I wasn't my check raise frequency on this board was just purely exploit. Exactly, um, and I think that's where I'm still at right now is more of an exploit frame of mind. But uh, this, this is interesting. What? Even in theory, yeah, yeah, you just don't want them to check back that because they're gonna free, they're gonna just freely realize their equity of like a lot of hands. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's just some, yeah, some, some next yeah, level I stuff. Can see that, especially out of position. Um, yeah, okay. So, so that's so that's that. So on, on the brick, the the turns are shifting from, um. Shifting towards an overbet strategy, right? So on this brick jack, you shift towards an overbet strategy where we're overbetting um, a lot of our, all, even a lot of our top pairs. So like even as soon as queen ten, and so say we overbet and then they call and then and then the turn just breaks out again. Um, that's not really a brick, but um, two was a brick, all right? So check and then you can see that queen that that king queen is is checked back as well, all right? So a lot of these um, hands that we can use to overbet on the turn after we see at the flop. Can then just check back on the river because we're in position. So, yeah. um, and then like our strong hands just um, overbet shove after we overbet the flop. So after we overbet the turn. So the the line here with with the sets on this run out. So say we got pocket sevens on this run out. Um, queen seven three is a flop. The turn is a jack, and the, and the two is um, the river. So the river is a two. Seven seven. We bet half the pot on the on the flop. The turn is the jack. So it's basically a brick. So we overbet the we have about the the um, we have about the turn with the sevens for twice a pot. They call, and then the river to two, which was basically another brick. Um, we have about the river for about one and a half times a pot um, there, and so that that is going to bring us to um, the, the the next part where we're talking about triple barrel. But do you guys have any more questions about this, or do you guys want another example of spots yeah. where we can um, have about as a double barrel? Yeah, I have a question. Um... So, cause I, cause I know, uh, George, George, is that you that, uh, is that you that was talking? Yeah, that was me. Yeah. Cause, uh, so, um, yeah, I want to know, so on other flops that are dry, for example, 10, well, okay. I don't want to necessarily say dry in that sense, but let's say a 10, six, 10, six, three rainbow. Um, is that frequency around the same as our, that we're going to check raise our sets like we would this queen seven three, like if it was ten seven three or nine five three rainbow. Like if if our opponent bets half part on nine five three rainbow, like is our threes and fives getting check raised there too? Because it seems seems like they would. Be. I mean, it seems like they would be. Or well, just based on what I'm looking now, I'm I'm thinking um. Yeah, I probably would want to check raise those uh, strong hands on the flop. Yeah, that's why I asked that question because I mean I know George because I'm thinking I had the same thought you were thinking, bro, not too long ago. So that's why, like, I'm, I'm just asking uh, Thomas. It's like, so like, yeah, if it's ten seven three or nine five three rainbow, how's the big blind playing against that uh that C bet? Like, I mean, I don't want you to go into sim stuff. Like, if you could, off the top of your head, or like, are we still check raising some sets and stuff there? Or because I mean, we're denying equity and we're building um, pot just in case we win. The, the reason why you don't want to check raise your sets on the flop, um, 
the the only real reason exploitatively that that um, you're going to want to use most of the time is if you know your opponent is just going to right. So your your check raises for value should be on the street, which you know that your opponent is going to um, give up afterwards. So um, so the lower flops they're more likely to double. Say so you're on the flop. General right. Um, um, in terms of GTO, should basically be check raising your sets on the flop a lot most of the time, right? Um, but See, nobody, that, nobody knew. I don't want to say no one knew that, but a, a shit. To, I know strong players, but in reality, there's not that many strong players. <laughs> so it's like, um, so yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but like, do you agree with me, George? Okay, so like, I'm going to talk about the difference between um, exploitatively calling your set. Okay. The reason why you want to trap your sets on the flop versus a C bet is going to continuation is going to, is going to double barrel the turn a lot at a high frequency. Okay, would trap your sets on the flop. Okay, if you know your opponent is going to bet the turn at high frequency. Now, is there and then in that's theory? A, that's a, in that's theory, a, that's a separate. There... What's up? Say, what are you saying? decision to why you would set, trap your sets on the turn okay um so that's that's one decision right do i know my opponent is going to barrel the turn at high frequency so if that's the case then okay i'm leaning towards trapping my sets on the flop and then raising them on the turn okay. but then on the turn my opponent bets if i know my opponent is going to continuation bet them a lot on the turn um sorry a continuation bet as a triple barrel on the river i'm going to lean towards calling my raising the river instead some of the some of these players that have um a high turn and river barrel you should be trapping your sets on the flop and because yeah. your opponent just bets the flop bets a turn yeah, the river yeah, that, too often yeah that makes there's right, no confusion right, okay. and like it, this this and this goes back to sort of like um sort of like the, the 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 weaker player and sort of like um even even the upswing strategy some of you guys might might come from from that sort of thing where they have um a low c bet frequency and a very a low flop c bet frequency and a very high double barrel and triple barrel frequency and the, the way to exploit that is to too value heavy. um take your um it, it's not that it's, it's too value heavy it's just that um it's too barrel heavy right the way to exploit that is, um, with your strong hands, like sets, is to trap them on the flop in the turn and not raise them until the river. Okay? Right, right, because they're likely, they're likely, that, likely you're going to win all that value from from your opponent's barrels on the on the the, the flop and the turn and the river. So you're going to win all that value from the triple barrel, and yeah. then you're going to win additional value from from your raise. Okay, right, right. I, I want to know, like, Thomas, in theory, so, is there the flop any at high frequency. Yeah, is there any boards that indicate? Like, is there any flops? Like, forget the opponent. Is there any flops in theory that will indicate higher frequencies? Like a lower board. Like, will a ten hot where will a ten, ten five three rainbow indicate in theory a higher barrel frequency than the queen seven three? Like, is is would that be a yes? Um, like wouldn't because wouldn't the board itself like the way I know the turn it depends on the turn and river but like so on, on 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 very on very wet boards and and wet is sort of like a, a vague term but say say you have a connected a connected a connected flop with a two tone connected flop right and then the flop yeah. is pretty connected then um you can expect them to bet the there, turn there's going to be there's going to be a high there's going to be a high flop and turn bet frequency because you have to deny equity when you have like a, a top bet hand okay. and then when you get to and then when you get to the river they're going to check back a lot so basically if you have a set there you can raise the flop with a set um or you can call it a small percentage of the time um, with the intention of of raising the raising the turn there's, there's going to be a high flop and turn bet frequency and then a lot of checkbacks on the river because all the equity has been denied at that stage. You can just check back and, and hope to win it showdown. Okay, so, so, so it's fine. So we're not capping our range. It all, so if we raise all of our sets there, uh, we're not really capping our range because I guess enough turns will come to improve our calling range enough to stop them from overbetting at a higher frequency, like since we're raising our sets on flop. 
Yeah, so say for example, um, you look here. So against this this bet half pot, so this is the queen seven three, going back to the queen seven three, that there's the there's all different turn cards that can improve both um, your your calling range, right? So um, say say the turn is an ace, right? Um, there's still gonna be some over bets, but not, not as many, right? Or if the turn is um, one of these things that completes one of the straights, there's still not as many, right? The the thing is there's a lot of checkbacks, so it's really only if you have um, a queen you're worried about them overbetting at like an incredibly high frequency, right? right? So if you're a proponent of frequency, thinking about um, trapping with pocket sevens or pocket threes there, because they're betting at a high frequency on the turn, and then they're um, and then you would raise the turn if they're betting at high frequency. But you can see um, that all these frequencies, even if the turn is a five, right? Um, they're checking 65% of the time. Um, an ace, they're checking 40% of the time, right? They're, they're just checking back a lot, right? Um, bet the flop, right? So that may actually if, never if, if they're checking back a lot, that. if they're checking back a lot on the turn, then it just makes sense for you to raise your sets on the flop. But if they're if they're not checking back often enough on the turn, right? If they're just barreling on the turn a lot. Then you can trap your sets on the flop, which is what okay, I was going yeah. on about, right? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because I ran a, I don't run, I haven't ran too many sims, but I did run a one. Um, it was um, I mean, I'm gonna be doing that a lot, like I should, but it was this ten seven three rainbow board, big blind button, and then it was like half pot bet, and then I noticed like uh, yeah, ten seven three, like um, hands like a uh, ace ten were raised in the flop, and then sets. Is that something? Am I like going somewhere else, or is that like kind of? Because I have yeah, I think like I've got, a, got a bit of off topic here. Um, the the, yeah, the it's point is, like, it's just that, different. It's so different. Like, I know, like, where you're coming from. Like, it's just so different. Like, because there's low here. flops. It's just um. So 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 the point is that after we've continuation about the flop, the out of position should raise many of their strong hands, like sets, right? So, and we we've talked a, a bit about. Um, exploitatively, why you shouldn't raise a set, but in general, you just should. Okay. Okay. See, um, that's because because weird. that it's, it's a way of preventing your opponent from from checking back too often. That's if if you nobody taught that, like with my study and that did not. I, I, yeah, that's that makes sense. I mean, that makes. I mean, that's it, makes, it, makes, it makes sense now that you've covered it, but um, no one's ever yeah. taught that to me. I've, I've never read it in any literature. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write my own book, and then suddenly uh, there'll be literature on it. Hey, I mean, um, you should, <laughs> shit. Hey, honestly, dude, you should. I'm telling you, you should, because you're, like, you're smart, bro. Like, you could, you could, if you wanted to, people would buy it. I'd buy it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll finish the course first, and then, and then. The reason, the reason okay. I'm on this course, Thomas. <laughs> All right. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Um, any more questions before we move on to the to the last to the last bit? I have more, but let's just go, let's just go to the next. Well, it's it's basically kind of about the same thing, but let's just go. <laughs> All right. Um, yep. Yeah, so the overbet triple barrel. Um, so basically, um, so we know from back from the Ace King Queen game. Um, so this Ace King Queen Jack game, the modified version where we have the the King and the Jack, and they have the Ace and the Queen, right? Where R is the frequency which they have the the Ace. Um, if we have if we have the the king, and the opposition player is pacified, then we know that the best bet size is um, here given s star right one over the square root of two r minus one. So here, if we have an example, one of the examples if is if they have the ace five percent of the time, we should bet um, two point one six times a pot with with the king, and that's the the um, the optimal bet size for this for this game. And you can use sort of similar thinking. Um, when we've said about Hold'em, um, I'm going to go to this next slide here first. If if we're playing infinitely deep against a, a pacifier against a opponent that isn't pacified, um, so in the same spot, right, Ace King Queen Jack um, game, but the opponent isn't pacified, so they can raise. Our bet size is given one of a four R instead. Okay, so. Um, what will happen is if we have the king, we're going to bet this S star size, 
and then um, when Alpsigen has an ace, they're going to check raise all in. They're going to check raise infinity with with an ace, and then the same number of of queen, right? So then our best bet size is is one point two four, right? So even if we're infinitely deep and and we don't have the nuts, um, we can still use over bets against an opponent that doesn't have many nuts in their range, right? So here they only have nuts five percent of the time. But even infinitely deep, we can still bet 1.24 times the pot. Okay, so that's just the math. Um, and then here's some of, the, some of the graphs of what it looks like, where um, as we get closer to one, we're getting closer to the nuts on the river. Um, the the bet size we can use against a, a pacified opponent is, is the red, right? So we can bet more if our opponent is pacified. And the blue is bet sizes we can use against a non-pacified opponent if I, if the stacks are infinitely deep. So basically, um, your opponent is, is always going to raise the nuts as well as an equal number of of bluffs for value against you. And when, when I say pacified opponent, right? It's it's a, you can you can use pacified opponent as as an exploit as an exploitative way of talking about a player that isn't going to bluff raise you. Okay, so if if your opponent is never going to bluff raise you, then they're essentially pacified because whenever they raise, they they only they they only have a very very strong hand, so you should always fold, um, which is the exact same as if they had just called with that strong hand, right? There is no difference between a player that never bluff raises you um, and a player that never never raises at all, right? Because they're never bluffing, and so you should never call. Um, and it's not going to make too many, and it's not going to make any mathematical difference to your EV. So you can use this this um, this equation here against players that are never going to bluff raise your overbet. Okay, so that's what it looks like, and you can see there's quite a different quite a difference in in uh, the optimal bet size between um, a player that is never bluff raising you and a player that um, is bluff raising you appropriately, and and you're very deep against them. Oh, good. So that's like, okay. uh, so you have to, so basically like they should be raising you at a certain frequency to keep you indifferent from like choosing like that size versus another size. Uh, like on the yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, they, they have, they have to raise you and then that reduces your, your EV. So if, if they, if they raise you without, without any bluffs, then you're going to always fold. And so you can pretend that they're pacified at that stage because okay. pacified just means that they're not raising at all. And if they're, if they're raising without bluffs, it's the same as if they didn't raise because you're always folding us anyway. Right? You always lose a pot if they have that hand. So it's mathematically the same. Okay. Mathematically, so a player that isn't bluff raising you is the same that, as a player that isn't raising you at all. Okay. So if they are raising it a certain frequency, that's when you have to start betting smaller. Like if they're raising it a high enough frequency, yeah. that's when you get smaller. Yeah, if, 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 if they're raising you um, as a bluff, Yes, it's right. a bluff. Yeah, yeah. If they start bluff raising you, then and you're very deep, then it then it gets closer to this blue line. line. Okay, yeah, because their frequency. Yeah, can't basically, get high um, they don't have bluffs. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So yeah, okay. that that's okay. that. Um, this, this is these these horizontal lines are, are units of the pot, pots is one pot, two pot. So there's no scale here, but one pot, two pot, three pot, etc. So you're. <laughs> The best bet size is going to be somewhere in between the red and the blue line most of the time. Okay. And against weaker opponents to exploit them, it's going to be close to the red line on the river. All right, so let's see if I can pull up an example. And that means overbet. <laughs> yep, so you're going to be overbetting um, more often against a player that isn't going to bluff raise you. Okay. Hey, uh, Thomas, on that um, queen 7-3, were those two pairs being uh, check raised on the flop as well? Like, or were, were uh, yeah, most of them were. Yeah, most of them were. Okay. Um, I'll see if I can find. And like you said, example. like our um, range, um, the yeah, our range is going to be safe on a, a lot of turn cards still, right? Because we'll we'll turn a lot of two pairs with our one pair hands. Or like we'll make a. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um. And, and your opponent just shouldn't be. Um, and your opponent should just be using their position to check back a lot. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I'm just I'm just writing stuff down. I'm just taking notes. I just want to make sure because sometimes when I go back over and look at my notes, because I write like they're like literally just notes. It's not really complete sentences. So 
sometimes when I go back and look over them, they look kind of wild. They, you know, they look kind of wild sometimes. <laughs> All right. So he, here's an example um, for more of a, of a connected, a connected flop. So it's connected flop. So um, Jack nine seven rainbow um, between the the big line and and the button, and we can see that the line that we took, we we bet half pot on the flop. The turn was an ace, so we bet again half pot on the turn, and then the turn is a two, and they've checked to us, and we have to decide what to do uh, on this river. So we can see that we're overbetting all in, and like this all in size here is around. Um, the rivers, the rivers are two. Yep, the rivers are two. Yep. Okay. Um, so it's jack nine seven is a flop, the ace is the turn, and then the rivers, uh, the rivers are two, and we bet half pot on the flop, half pot on the turn. So in the sim, we can see that. Um, when we get to this river in, in this way, it, we would have bet um, pocket two some of the time um, to get here. But we can see that we're still using this overbet size. Um, this is a overbet size of around five times the pot on the river. And we're, we're just um, jamming it in with pocket twos. <laughs> so, okay, cool. So, um, so we're double barreling. I see it. On the uh, it says half of the twos. So like, are we double bar uh, are we double barreling all of our twos, or it just had like it just? Um, it's just some of the twos, right? So we bet some of the twos on the flop. So here around half of them, and then um, when we bet and then and then we call the ace is good for our our range. So we have now a um a range advantage, but as well as like an advantage. Because our opponent would have raised all of their all of their straights on the flop, but now we have a range advantage, so we can use our top pairs to, to bet the turn and then check back the river. So we bet the turn and then they call, right? So they would have raised the remaining of their of their sets and straights, um, and then they call, and we can see on the river now that we're we're just going to be checking back the majority of our top pairs, right? All right. But we're using aces, a very polar size. So are our ace is going to be bet for half pot on the turn or pot then check back. Um, it's a mix of both. Okay. Here in the sim, it's a mix of both. Okay. So say you want to bet pot, you want to bet seventy-five percent pot. Like you want to simplify your tree to bet seventy-five percent pot, you could do that. Okay, and I see the jacks from the flop are getting are checked a lot on the turn. Uh, no, top set is still bet. Well, our one sing our top our single pair of jacks. Um. Oh no, I see it. I never mind. I'm sorry. I'm looking at it wrong. It's just for a smaller set for half pot. Yeah, so they're they're more they're, they're more going to go half pot on the turn and then um, okay. check back. Could you go to the flop? Could you highlight uh just for like five seconds? Could you highlight the uh, the flop action, the C bet, the flop? So this is sort of what the C bet looks like on the flop. Um, this this is this is in the important this isn't the important bit. The important bit is we've continuation bet the flop for half pot. They call the turn is an ace. We continuation bet half pot on the turn. Um, they call and the river is a brick. Yeah, that we, so capped. we that yeah our opponent is very very capped that we can overbet our sets right we can jam pocket twos for gotcha. five or times five a pot. X. <laughs> right i love it i love it all right cool yeah yeah um so so many people are scared to i mean i i mean some me too of course sometimes but lately i kind of been going for it wrong sometimes but you got to go for it sometimes like that 5x, so many people would just bet 2 or 3x there. Like, that's still big. That's super big to them, but you just got to uh, put them chips in. <laughs> like yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So you, you, should, you, should know, you shouldn't be really like afraid to, scared, to do dude. that. Like so a, you... a, a lot of people are scared. They're like, when I mean scared, like, they'll go 2 or 3x, and they'll be like, damn, I just made a great bet. But then they just they should have went 5x. <laughs> Yeah, um, and and they actually lose a lot of a lot of EV doing EV doing yeah. doing that. So I'll show you the difference. Actually, um, it's a shit ton. Um, well, probably not because there's still going to be some raises. But see here with pocket twos, where am I for lock the sets? Right. So here with with pocket twos, um, jamming pocket twos wins thirty point four, but going um, going twice the pot is only twenty nine point nine. Going pot is thirty point one, and then half pot is twenty nine point nine. So the difference is um, in this sim, um, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 of a big blind, which in other words is um, half a big blind is is fifty BB per hundred hands. Um, difference between not shoving all in.
right? That's a lot, 50 BBs. <laughs> yep, so yeah, 50 BB per 100, per 100 hand decisions are, um, are quite a bit, and that's just the decision between shoving all in and just over betting twice the pot or betting pot, right? So a lot, a lot of difference there in terms of EV. And our jacks are, I see our jacks are going for the, what's that, the two, That's is that 2x pot with the jacks? Is that because we block a lot of their uh, bluff catchers, I'm guessing? Yeah. Right, and then you can see that they're pretty capped, right? They only hit the, the strongest is two pair, um, which they which they call on the turn, right? So they never have a, they never have a, a straight. So the straight is uh, is like never there, um, and they never have any any. They almost never have any sets, right? So the sets are they have very very low frequency. Um, the, the straight should all, should have all been raised on the turn as well as most of the sets on the turn, and so they're, they're capped at two pair. And so because they're capped at two pair, we can very comfortably shove all in with with all of our sets, okay. which is what we do. Well, what's their two pair cap? What cap? What two pair are they capped at? Was it? They they have they have ace jack. Ace jack. Okay, ace jack. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. In our shove, it had is it uh. So our shove ace jack plus we go go back to that again. Um, remember? so yeah, we can shove some of ace jack as well. Yep. Um, it goes back to um, this over here. So it goes back to this equation here with R. So let's say um. We get our handy calculator out. Um, we can rearrange this, um, and so then S. So we can rearrange this in terms of R. So I'll, I'll let you guys do that at home. Get grab a piece of paper and rearrange that in terms of R. So you guys should be able to do that if you um if you went through high school. So S star. Let's say R is 0.1 percent. Let's say R is one percent, right? So 0 0.01. So then it's going to be one divided by the square root of um. Only one divided by zero point zero two square root, right? And then minus one. So if so, if our opponent if our opponent's range beats our hand, our opponent's bluff catching range beats our hand only one percent of the time, then we can overbet around six times the pot um, without flinching. Hey, did you? Uh, I'm sorry. Did you say anything the past like ten seconds? I should hear my uh, my baby had to tinkle. Yeah, what was I? Um, where's the? Okay, so we're using a R is one percent. Okay, in other words, we have a very strong hand on the river, and we think it's only going to be beat one percent of the time. And we're thinking about which size we can use the triple barrel. If our, if a hand is only beat one percent of the time. So then R is going to be 0 0.01. And so we're going to figure out what the S star is. And so we go 1 divided by um, 0 0.02 square root, right? So 2 times 0 0.01. Um, and then we get 7, then we subtract 1. And so we can bet 6 times a pot on the river um, pretty, pretty easily. So play around with, with this equation as well as the next one. Um, so I'm missing that example. What's the weakest uh, value hand that um, you're five x shoving with? Where you showed you your bluffing with the pocket too? Was the ace jack? Ace jack is it? Um, so yeah, in, in this in this example, the other bet shoves was ace jack was the weakest one, um, with ninety nine percent equity, and then um, ace nine has ninety six percent equity. So you can see that the difference between ninety nine percent equity and ninety six percent equity on the bet sizes, and we can we can do we can do the math for that now if you want. Yeah, yeah, um, that's, that's interesting. So here, um, that was just nine percent equity, but let's say um, ninety-eight. Um, let's just compare ninety-eight to ninety-five, right? Um, let's that, compare ninety-eight to ninety-five, right? So it's that. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It is pretty sensitive. But um, the the thing is to realize is that um, the when you get close to this optimal size, that the EV difference between 
um, bedding quite often. It, it is pretty sensitive, so you do have to have a, a good um, idea. But it is sensitive in the in the sense that what's the difference between one percent and five percent, right? Well, they're bed, they're bedding us five times as often, which is actually quite a lot. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so one divided by um, let's say we have ninety eight percent equity, so it's going to be zero point zero um, four, which is two times zero point zero two um, square root. Um, five minus one. So if we have ninety-eight percent equity, we can bet four times a pot. And if we have um, ninety-five percent equity, then it's going to be um, actually I have it there already. Um, but let's say ninety. Let's say ninety-two percent equity, right? If we have ninety-two percent equity, then it's going to be one divided by zero point one six square root uh, minus one. Okay, so one point five times a pot, right? As as a decent size. So that's the difference between. 98% equity and 92% equity. We're betting four times a pot with 98% equity um, against their bluff catching range, and we're and betting um, one and a half times a pot with only 92% equity. What hands have? Are there any hands that have situation that have 92? Or would uh, I mean that would be that's for 1.5x, right? Yeah. That, those are just some examples of of what's going on, and we can see um, why Ace Jack can shove all in, but Ace Nine can't. Right, okay. it's because of that difference in equity. There's a, there's a this one's the ace jack has got ninety eight point eight eight percent equity, versus the ace nine has got only um, ninety six point okay. six, okay. which, see... which is still a lot. But it's the difference between shoving five times a pot and only okay. only ever betting twice the pot. And then jack nine a seven. Okay, so those are two x. I see. Is that two x eighteen? Because it's there's nine in there or. Yeah, so this, this is just an example of the simulation. So if, if you change the the tree a bit, or if you change the preflop ranges a bit, you might not get to the same, the yeah. exact same um, frequencies on this river. But you would still probably see that sets are going to overbet jam for um, quite a large size. Okay. Hey, uh, a little off topic, but <laughs> are you uh, are you still cooking up the uh, versus 4X? <laughs> yep, um, they're, they're on the website now. Oh, are you serious? Oh, it's like mm. oh, it's like a birthday. It's like a an early uh, well, my birthday's not till next year, but it's like an early birthday present. <laughs> early Christmas. Uh, Christmas forex. Oh, look at forex that. Opens, so, yeah. Look at that, huh? Look at. Don't even show me yet. You're teasing me. Just get away. Okay, get off it. Get off it. Oh, get off it. Oh. Cool. Yeah, because I'm gonna be playing some five five uh, some five five this week. Well. Today is today. Yeah, today's Saturday. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna be playing some five five, so I'm gonna be uh, work using them. All right. So, um, yep. So we've been through quite a bit. Do you want to go through some of the hand histories now? Um, so, whose hand history was first? Um, Slim, you see here with us. Now, there's just George, then Lorenzo. Okay, well, his hand history isn't here, so how about we go through... Um, yeah, when you put up... Uh, let's, go, let's go through um, his hand history. So, George is your hand history, so do you want to talk us through what you were thinking? Under the gun. Hello? George still here? Yeah, well his mic's muted. Yeah, I'm just looking at the hand history. I like the uh... All right, what what what, what do you think what do you think about it? Sorry, I was uh, I was talking while I was on mute. Can you hear me now? Yep, yeah. Okay. So just um, talk us through what you were thinking. Yeah, this so, hand history. Um, under the gun with uh, Queen Jack. Uh, Page. Um, raised to a standard two and a half. Called by the cutoff and um, flop up and down with a back down with a back door um, flush draw. Um, text over to me. Oh, no. Sorry. I actually checked that, that hand. 
um, I think what I was looking there was I was um, looking to get a bit crappy here and um, let they cut off that because I'm out of position. And um, what I want to do is um, basically I want to build a big pot and essentially get it in. Um, I got so much equity here. So he bets uh, six big blinds after I check. I raise. Um, now my thinking on the turn is um, basically given that he called on the uh, on the flop, um, I'm I'm immediately saying to myself, he does not have a strong hand. Because he would, all of his sets, um, two pairs, etc., would be um, wanting to uh, re-raise um, on the flop. So luckily I flop a bit more equity, and I decide to overbet the turn, and I probably would overbet the turn anyways if it were like a three of clubs or any kind of brick. That was my thinking as I went through that hand. Yeah. Okay. So the the what you said about imposition um, here, cut off here, not raising their their sets and stuff against your against your your check raise. Couldn't they flat um, them? They can flat. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Uh, I think they'll be flat a lot uh, a lot of the like time. Most of the time. I think most of the time they'll be flat. To be honest. Um, Would you think about that check raise, Thomas? Because I mean, I don't. I like. I mean, I can. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. Okay, cool, cool. For balance, uh, because I, what do you think about like a um, on this board also a hand like, well, actually, yeah, I like Jack Queen. What about um, like, what do you open it from under the gun? So, yeah, what would you say about eight nine of spades? Even though that's not, because I, I like following them uh the zenith charge. What do you think about eight nine of spades uh check raising here? Yeah, I think that's also a decent idea. I mean, they're, they're both open-ended straight draws. There's no, there's no reason why you can't do... No, eight and, eight do, nine, do. like middle middle pair with the back door. Draw. Oh, eight, eight, nine. Eight, um, eight, nine. I thought you said eight, seven, my bad. Um, eight, eight, nine of spades. I mean, I usually... Sometimes yeah, usually, I would... You usually you have, to, you have to say it the, the wrong way around. you got to say, gotta say the, the higher ranked one first, and then other people won't get confused. Um, so it's a nine, eight of spades. Um he, uh, do you like that check raise in the flop here? With nine eight, yeah, I guess you can do it as a bluff some of the time because okay. you, your check raise range, you're still gonna need some some middle ranked cards, um, in it just in case the the middle the middle card pairs. Um, let's see if I can pull up a similar flop, and um, just to just to show you. Yeah, that's a nice uh, nice flop check raise, uh, George. Thank you. I mean, as you know, we, we don't get these spots too often. I I, I love check. Yeah, I like uh, I like doing shit like this when I this play. This is this is a this is a different spot, but on on ten eight four, with with a flush draw, um, between big blind and and the button, um, it goes check and then you pot and then there's a raise, um, of about four x. You see, not not all of the sets are going to to re-raise and not all the two pairs are going to re-raise either. So most of the most of the sets when you're in position can just flat and then see a turn if you and if they um, if they get checked to they're going to be betting or if they face a bet they're just going to call or, or, or jam on top of it. Why right? the sets so, not, why why the sets not raising for example Thomas just um, just as a thought you want to utilize this, this position. Is, yeah, this is one of the right out of position type thing. When you're in position, you can just flat very, very a lot of the strong hands. You can Since sort of get away with with not having. This part. Um, well, you're not super polarized when you bet the flop as a C bet, or here well, in position, check. you're gonna see that some some That's hands which check, in, check back the turn. Um, so against the check raise, out of position is the guy that that is very polarized, and so you're gonna want to yeah, just call. Yeah, is that why the sets flat? Because out of position, yeah. is and and often and often players who um, are out of position are barreling too much on the turn anyway. So it's a good reason to to exploitively just flat those hands um, against the check raise on the flop. What's Billin going to be uh, defending with here um, against a uh, against a shove on the river? I'm sorry, shove on the turn. Oh, the sets. 
Well, all, all the sets of the two pairs, probably a, a lot of the top pair kicker type hands, um, the top pair good kicker type hands. It, especially with a flush draw, like it, like there's there's still ten x of um, of hearts available, and they're all going to snap you off. Um, a, a lot of it is like even though you're overbetting twice the pot, because a lot of your draws have draw equity, and those draws are going to are always going to see um, the river after. After um, after imposition calls, they ha imposition has to call wider than um, the alpha in order to make those draws indifferent to shoving. Okay, cool. That made a yeah. I was just about yeah. You just answered. That's just about to, um. Okay, cool, cool. So, what about when um we have to defend a little more than alpha because there's like because there are bluffs and all that, and there's another street to come. What if uh um in order to defend a little more than alpha. Like, do we have to make sure we have some strong draws in there too? Because what if, like, our two pair, our top pair plus hands don't add up to enough to defend a little more than alpha? Like, are we going to have to call with some, just hopefully some draws that dominate their draws? Yeah. So here, cut off. My like hand. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure what what cut off has like pre flop. Ace, uh, like because, ace jack um, of cards. The, if they didn't three pre flop. Yeah. Yeah, so like ace five ace of hearts would probably snap. Um, okay. Well, yeah, ace five definitely with the gut shot. But if they had ace jack of hearts for hard whatever hard. reason, would ace, ace jack ace of hearts? Jack of hearts is getting. Would they pro 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 probably probably not because it's a two x pot bet. Yeah. And they're probably not getting the odds there. But okay. all, all, of the, all of the pair plus flush draws can probably call. Okay. Cool. Um, now, when we don't have. Uh, these combo draws in our range, then we're gonna have to. Do we have since we have to defend more than alpha? We're gonna have to go down to the nut flush draws, right? If we don't like, you know, just let's say hypothetically. We, we probably shouldn't speak too much about what cutoff is doing here, um, because we're never cut off, so we can't really speak for him. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. We're never cut off because we don't have any fighting have a fighting range profile. Gotcha. Oh, I got a. Uh, this is kind of a side note, so. Um, so for live, for example, uh, if I do want to flat some hands, like I, I'm just three better full most of the time too, but if I do want to flat some hands here, do I just, um, since my construction and my range is going to be like so much weaker than my opponent's opening range, since I'm just flattening some random stuff, like, do I just fold a lot, I guess? Like since, for example, like if under the gun opens and we're in the cutoff, uh, we're three bet in like sevens plus ace 10 plus ace four ace five and all that do i uh if i want to flat twos to fives i know we got to do the math for set mining am i just going to fold a shit ton since my range is going to be like 60 40 underdog on the flop like since i'm three betting and then i want to flat hands that aren't three betting you know you know what right, I'm saying? If, if, if you're exploitatively set mining then you're going to yeah. play exploitatively so it doesn't make too okay, much cool. sense to think about perfect. think about perfect. whether or not you're trying to make your opponent's bluffs indifferent or whatever yeah perfect that's um, so okay that makes sense you shouldn't talk you shouldn't you shouldn't talk about um playing gto if you're playing really okay. really far away from gto to start off with yes okay I, I was talking to a friend uh this was probably this was months back but um okay cool cool yeah i was talking to a friend that they were playing a one three and they were talking about how Okay, cool. And I told them that, uh, no, you shouldn't do that because you're already like, why would you play exploiter from the first place if you're going to try to put, like play GTO on the flop? That makes no sense. But like, he was like, he, he kind of didn't want to listen to me. But okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty. Um, if if you you play exploitatively pre and then like you suddenly want to swap the GTO on the flop, I don't. That doesn't make any. Yeah. Any sense at all. <laughs> Right. If okay. you're playing exploitatively pre, then you should already figure. You should already sort of know what what you're doing exploitatively post. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Just stick to the exploit that you're that you that you were making to start off with. Okay. Um. So, does anyone else have a hand history or or any spots which um they're thinking about overbetting? Um. This one. Yeah, I didn't get. I didn't have any. Um, yeah, I was. I was going to be sleeping for this. I didn't have anything. But I'm. Uh, um, I'm gonna post a few in the uh, the Facebook group though, uh, just to, not not in relation to this though, but just just because. Okay, so I guess we'll go through. Um, through 
through Slim's hand. So here he's constructed it like this. Basically, the channel rewinds deep. Um, the and here is the button, and the villain is big blind. So it's button versus big blind. Um, min raise call flop ace ace six check bet one third pot, um, which is good. Check bet eighty percent of the pot. Um, so a quarter pot there really doesn't matter, right? Like, I mean, that one third, like that's basically that. That ain't shit, right? That eight percent difference. Sorry, what's the question? Like, I like, what if I want to bet like slightly smaller on this flop? That don't really. It's whatever. Um. Well, I personally would just bet one big blind. So he's okay. bet one and a half, which is okay. Gotcha. Um, Anyways, between yeah, that, anyways between between one, one, one and one and a half, I think is is all right. Okay, um, cool. So that's good. And then the turn is a seven, so that brings us um, a boat. And then check bet eighty percent call, which is which is um, I don't see any, any problem with that. Um, and then it goes check over bet one and a half ish times a pot, and then they jam um, for eighty dollars on top of on top of that. Um, so I, I don't mind. I don't mind th these decisions up here. Yeah, because shouldn't they the, be raising the flop a lot? Like, what, and then they should three bet nines pre flops. Uh... All right. Does anyone have any, any decision? Um, any um. Yeah. I, any ideas question. about about this hand? Yeah. Any, um. Any, um any analysis of this hand? Has anyone thought about this hand, or has any any any, any anything that they want to say about this hand? Yeah, I have. I want to say uh, our turn size and what can um, how would we like pick what's would some hands in our range go smaller or bigger, or is the majority going to go for like you know around this size? And... Well, after opponent calls the flop. Their range is going to be a lot stronger than ours, so we can. Do, so we're going to be checking back a lot, and then we're going to be continuing with with a larger size closer to pot. So I don't mind this. Okay, and then um, okay. So they should be. Should they be a uh, check raising the flop with a lot of their aces, right? Yeah, because we bet so small, I'm going to check back on on the turn. So they need to raise quite frequently in order to prevent us from from doing that to realize our equity against like a six. Okay. What, that's, um, the point raised, that's the point you raised earlier, Thomas, with that queen something board. Um, so yeah. wouldn't that mean if uh, if they just called the flop that they probably are pretty weak going into the turn, and um, why wouldn't you want to overbet the turn? Um, well, there's that, but they they can still call some of the ace x type hands on the flop with the intention of raising the turn or raising the river. So some of them should be raised, definitely, but not all of them, and some six x hands should be raised. But not all of them. So, um, it's a mixed strategy. Yeah, yeah it's a mixed now, strategy. It's mean, not always going to be raising all your aces because then you're incredibly exploitable on the turn because you never have the trips there. So, yeah. um, you would should it still be, raising be some most? Of them. Would, it, would it be most, or what, what's your sum? Like, is that like half of them? Well, the the because you put more money in um, with a raise, you, your range for that. For your range for the raise versus the range for the call was going to be um, more dense with strong hands. So the raising range is going to have a great density of strong, of strong hands, so a great density of ace x hands than the calling ranges. So if if um, for whatever reason um, the big one here decided to construct their range such that they're folding half the time, raising um, a quarter of the time. And then calling the other quarter of the time. That means that the ace x hands are going to raise more often than call. Okay, but because still... the ace x hands want to be um, have high density in the raising range. Okay, cool. So let so if we have like um, let's just say like forty combos of aces on the flop, are we raising thirty of them flat in ten? I mean, I know that's kind of fucking random, but something like that, or is it yeah. more? Yeah. So yeah, but if 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 the call if the, if the calling range and the raising range are, are the same size, then more of the ace x would be allocated to the raising range than of the calling range. Some of them will still be called, but not all of them. 
What do you mean if it's the same size? What are you ta- oh, are you talking about the 2525? Yeah, the 2525. Okay. Now, on this turn, uh, are we checking back any um strong, like, is this one of the spots where, like, it's, like, a super small frequency? Like, checking well, back a strong hit on the turn? Since, I mean, their calling range is kind of strong. Yeah, so on, on this turn, it's basically um, a brick for most of the hands. Um, only really a 7x improves over a 6. So a lot of a lot of the hands which we bet the flop with, and on this flop, we're basically going to be betting our entire range. All the hands which, which bet the flop with are going to check back on the turn because the turn range is so much stronger now. And okay. so the the hands which gotcha. we're going to continue on, on the turn um, are more like ace x which we might decide triple barrel with and some but other any, hands which we're going to turn and check small, back like is there any a small fraction of those strong yeah that yeah i get that but is there any like so are we checking back the turn with any x's or any boats or uh any yeah are we going to check back the turn on for with any aces or boats like yep so you all? can some of the time um let's keep it really how small about, how, how about you think about which which ace x you would do that with um, I would do it with the high, uh, with, um, I guess the so dry board the ones that block their block their checks right so which which one yeah, is that um, the high the the wouldn't that be the high ones you said the ones that block their turn checks yep so no, block block the block the river checks yeah so we're thinking you're thinking about checking back. The turn, right? So you better flop and check back the turn with an ace. Uh-huh. Um, with trips here, which one are you going to check back? It's the one that's going to be blocking the river checks, right? So it's going to be which ones? Wouldn't that be the higher? Wouldn't that be the higher ones? The, the ones that don't block any of the draws? Like, um, huh? Yep. Yeah, so which one? I guess ace eight. What, what would it be the lower ones like ace five, ace four? Now you, you want you want to block their their checks, right? So which hand is going to check? Which hand type is going to check um to you on the river a lot of the time? And that that's after that's after yeah. we check back the turn, obviously, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, that would be. I guess the middle one, like eights or eights or higher, right? Wouldn't it be? Okay, so yeah, some some of those might might check, but I'm I'm thinking more like um, king high, um, king, king king high, right? Yeah, so a, a lot of high, a lot yeah. of the king highs can call the flop, and then on the river they're just going to check and hope to get the showdown against a wiki king high or something like that. So you're going to want to so block ace, king high. So ace king. So, so ace, ace, ace king might might be used as as a check back and then raise river kind of hand. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, that's what I was interested in because I, that's what I was. Okay, the check back. Well, okay, cool, cool. It's just the thinking about the check back now that just makes you think a little more in depth about their range, you know. Yeah. Okay. So we bet, and then you get to the river like this, and then we overbet. Um, what do you guys think about the river overbet? Knowing what what we discussed previously. Um, sevens. Yeah, because they can't have. Yeah, I mean they would raise, like they don't have hardly any aces. Um, sixes. I mean, yeah, it seems good. To... Oh, shouldn't we go bigger? Okay, if you sh- if we should go bigger, what? Why should we go bigger? Because we're crushing them. <laughs> um, because. Like the math, isn't that the math you just showed us? Uh, like five minutes, well, like ten minutes ago, as far as um. Okay, let's percent- let's let's say okay. Let's let's have a think about how often um, our opponent is is beating us. So if we have pocket sevens, how often do we think that our opponents our opponent has a hand better than us? Called flop. Very rare. Turn. Yeah, I mean, because they didn't raise any aces on the turn. I mean, they're not river in the boat. Um, 
what the fuck do they sevens uh sevens full a six a seven and an a six on the flop yeah i don't yeah shouldn't we like shouldn't we jam i mean because there's 80x more so 96 so that's like 5x 6x yeah shouldn't we just jam the river ourselves Okay, so um, go think back to think back to the math. Um, how often do we have to be beat in order for a six x jam on the river to be okay? That's one one percent, right? One percent. So if we think our opponents has a stronger hand less than one percent of the time, then we can jam the river ourselves. It looks like that here. <laughs> um. Yeah, because I, uh, I'm just trying to think, what are they calling the turn with as well? Like, I don't know, because I mean, what are they calling the turn with as well? Because the turn they would call the turn's a brick. Um, so I guess they're calling the turn with some aces, right? Like ace. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's totally okay for them to to call um, an ace on the turn after they call on the flop. Yeah, and that's going to make up a lot of that's actually going to make up a lot of their range. Yep, so ace yeah. x is going to make a lot of their range. Yeah, so, um, so well, we got the we got a boat. I mean, we got a boat, so yeah, we have sevens. Seven's full. So ace so they're a six and they're ace nine. How would they play that? Cause uh So I the hands they're worried about is mainly it's gonna be ace ace six, ace seven, and ace nine. Um there's also gonna be nine nine, which they can have as well. Um wouldn't they three bet uh, this is hero versus wouldn't they three bet that preflop? Um, is it? Is they, they might. They might. They might three bet that some of the time. They might not. So they might three bet that all the time. They might not. They might three bet it some of the time. So yeah. I think they've got. Well, I mean, just going through the combo, they probably have about. I mean, because eight combos of hands that beat us. I mean, uh, eight six. What's that? Four combos. Uh, eight. Seven is what? One, two combos, ace, nine, two more. I mean, that's well, probably going to make up more than 1% of the uh, total hands that beat us. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, ace, six is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Six, so, yeah, that's six combos. So, shit, so, can we. Yeah, we shouldn't even. Yep, so oh. um, that, that's, that's, that's good there. Um, you can think about it in terms of total combos, but not all of those combos are going to. I'm just going to flat the flop and then flat the turn. Yes, yes, um, you you have to think about it more in terms of percentage about which hands are going to beat you. So the total combos that you think that they get here with. So say they only get here with um, with one combo of S six, right? It doesn't seem like a lot, but if their if their range is um, if their range is only fifty combos when they get here, which it probably isn't, it's probably a lot, lot lot wider. If the range is only fifty combos when they get here. That's still two percent of hands that beat you. That are beating you, yeah, so it's something yeah. you can't shove all in. Yep. So ace. Yeah, I mean, I guess as long as they're balanced in their boat, like as long as they're doing that with their boats, because like a lot of their aces are gonna raise to flop and then. All right. Turn. Let's 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 say let's say we're only worried about ace nine. Um, and let's say ace nine for whatever reason calls down. Um, we have to sort of estimate how big their entire range is um, getting here. Okay, so if we worry about ace nine and they have all the ace nine, how many combos of ace nine is that? Well, that's six. Well, three and two, so six. Yep, so six combos of ace nine. And then we have to have an estimation of how big um, their river range is. Getting here in terms of total number of combos. 
yeah that's okay so yeah that's uh yeah even that size so then the bet he made's too big um we'll, we'll get to that so on the flop so pre-flop how many combos do we think that they have you said pre-flop yeah so pre-flop you guys know your, your pre-flop combinations number of, yeah. of combos you have in total um yeah, on yes. this flop it's gonna be around 600 ish so they're calling around half the half the time pre-flop um so around 600 ish here and then you bet um even even small on isn't it less than because now? it's a paired board because aren't we only calling a quarter so wouldn't that just be 150. so pre-flop 600 and then on on the flop aren't we only getting to the turn with 150 since we're rate we're folding half and raising half well raising a quarter yep yep so we yep so we're getting there right so On the on the flop on pre flop with six hundred, on this turn sorry pre flop with six hundred on the flop, um, let let's say they call a third of the time and then raise twenty percent of the time and then fold the rest something like that. Um, so it's going to be a third of what was that? It's going to be a third of um, the six hundred. So it's going to be two hundred going to the turn, and then going to the turn against a. Uh, an 80 percent ish pot bet they're going to fold around half the time so let's say they have 100 110 combos right so the six combos are base nine into the 120 let's say for the math to make it easy right so, so six over 120 his, is so is five percent okay so then, so then the five percent means that the the best bet size we can use if our opponent is pacified is what Five percent. So it's one six x, and then four two. Um, half pot. Wait, four is two. Um, so if the opponent is pacified, then it's going to be um, one divided by two times zero point zero five. So it's going to be zero point one. Then we take the square root of that. So one divided by the square root of zero point one, zero point one six, and then we subtract one, and so then the bet size is going to be two point one six. So the opponent is pacified, and if the opponent isn't pacified and and you're infinitely deep, it's going to be one divided by four times zero point zero five. So it's going to be one divided by zero point two square root um, minus one, one point two three six. Okay, so it's going to be somewhere in between two point one six and one point two three four. Um, sorry, and 1.236. So that basically means that an overbet here is probably okay. Yeah, it looks like that bet's all right. <laughs> right, given sort of the, 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 the math that we, we, we did um, just on the fly, this overbet looks okay. Right, and now we have to think about, so do you guys all agree that this overbet is okay or do you guys have um, still have some problems with that? Problem I have is that by the time I go through all these calculations and figure it out, someone's going to call the floor on me. Well, that's yeah, why you, okay. you got to do this shit off the table. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, only, I'm, only, I'm only joking. <laughs> I mean, you got to do all this off the table. I agree. So you do some of this well, off the table, and you look at some simulations as well. Um, I hear what you say there, because as soon as he, he yeah, was like, as I count the comp, like yeah, six hundred. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so. Um, then we're facing this raise, okay? And the, the way that we deal with with raises is you calculate what the raise size is. So it's going to be 80 divided by um, what's in the pot to start with, so 9.75 plus 16.5 plus 16.5, right? So now they've overbet 1.87 as their raise. Okay, so we can calculate alpha from this. Um, so alpha is going to be 1 over 2.87. Um, sorry, other way around. Um, 1.87 divided by 2.87. Okay, so it's going to be 0 0.65. So alpha is 0 0.65, which means that against this jam, we need to fold 0 0.65 of... Uh, value range 
to prevent our opponent from profitably um, to make our opponent's bluffs basically indifferent. So this is not 0 0.65 of our entire range. This is 0 0.65 of our opponent's value range. So of 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 our of our value range. So our our overbet value range could be just boats, right? So for example, our overbet value range is boats, and maybe like ace ace king or something. Um, but we don't have too many of them. But let's just say it's just boats. So we have to say we we're overbetting all the boats, um, which we, which we could have. So let's say sixes and sevens, and then a six. A seven, right? Which we're overbetting, um, and then after we face the raise, we have to think about how big our value range is, and then fold the bottom two thirds ish of that. So is we have to think: is pocket sevens in yeah. the top third, or is it in the bottom two thirds of bottom our third, bottom third for sure? <laughs> Yeah, so it's, we're, we're falling in the bottom two thirds. So it's if it's, it's yeah, in the bottom third, then yeah, it's a pretty easy flop. Yeah, it's for sure. Yeah, I had a um, I had a hand like that. I posted. I mean, I kind of play. I had. It but was the, like, but had there's like, another thing like it's whether or not you're also overbetting some some other stuff like ace king and ace queen, yeah. right? Because then that would push up sevens towards um the top third. So whether it's in the top third or not in the top third. But ace um, and, and then there's other stuff which you have to think about um, in terms of like blockers, because if your if your opponent is knowing that um, you're only ever calling this raise with boats with an ace, then they should bluff raise an ace because you're going to be folding basically um, basically everything because they have good blocker effects against your ace, um, your 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 calling range, and so knowing that. You kind of have to try and make an ace x type hand indifferent to to bluff raising you so you probably have to call a hand like this some of the time just because yeah, of just because to make um blocker shoves with an ace indifferent okay now i have a question um okay so with the ace that they're going to use it's going to be the one that uh just misses alpha right um it's going to be the one that just just within alpha just within, okay, the weakest, the weakest one, right? Yeah. That, okay. That's sort of what they should be. That's sort of what they they should be trying to do. Okay, girl, that is the lawnmower, and you gotta stop barking. <laughs> yeah, I got a German Shepherd. She's only four months, but she's a savage. All right. Um. Okay. Cool. Now about. Okay, so going going back to the Ace King Ace Queen. Um. Could we? I, mean, I guess could we go? We would basically we would just run the math again, and like I, that would definitely be a a smaller bet. But um, I guess would they still be getting there with enough uh, ace rags? Like for us to for us to want to bet ace king ace queen, or like are we just gonna have to bet uh, release like? Like really small, like half pot or something. Yep. So that's 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 another thing. Um, so I'll show you guys up the because that opens us up to the check rate. That opens us up to being a check raised or. I guess. So if we, if we go back to this math, um, we know from the Ace King Queen Jack Ten game, um, that if there's a blocker, right? So if your opponent's calling range blocks your your value range, or if more specifically, your value range blocks their calling range. Then it's going to be two R plus T, where T is like the, the the blocker effect. Okay, so because you have an ace, because you have ace king, and you're targeting, um, or and you're trying to get value from your opponent's weak ace x hands, because you block half their ace x hands, um, you're going to have to add plus T, where T is the number of ace x which they had in total. That's before or after. You, uh, well, does that equation already take that's, into account? I guess that, that's that's the that's the that's um, as their calling range, um, that's of their entire range without okay. blocker effects, okay. and then T is the blocker effect Wait. which you put in. Okay, so a ace king would be, um, usually would probably not be overbet very often, it, it could be overbet some of the time, but. 
probably not as often because of that blocker effect um, okay. that your opponent would have against you. So it might only bet pot. Yeah, that makes sense because then, yeah, that makes sense because they're raising on the flop in turn sometimes too. So. Also, yeah, another thing is. Yeah, I got to work on this. I got to use this these equations a few times to. Yeah, I guess I guess doing this not too many times, you definitely would start to get a little feel for the. Definitely start to get a little feel. Like it, it definitely seems great because I'm not, like, I mean, yeah, it's that equation. That equation would scare the shit out of a lot of people. But like, it's not. It doesn't seem that hard. Like if you do it a few times, you probably get a good feel for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's using and it's using the equation a few times, getting used to it, and 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 comparing what you're seeing with the equation to like the the sims that you're running. Um, another thing which which we probably didn't talk about is. Um, here it can probably have a straight here sometimes, and then have a bit of straight. So, oh, because um, you don't block any. Yeah, you don't block any aces. Yeah. So, so knowing that if we're overbetting a straight, and then um, our opponent shoves, then the question is, where is pocket sevens in in the in the value range, right? And how many straights would we have? Maybe like three. Um, well, yeah, because wouldn't we bet our whole range? We'll see bet our whole range on this slot, right? Yeah, so the straight is 10, 8, and um, oh yeah, quite a few. Eight, eight six. Ten. So actually, we probably have we probably have Five, quite eight. a few. So eight um, of them at least. Yeah, so we have to think about our our entire value range, and then we're folding around two thirds of that. So then the sevens might might be in that by by quite a margin. Even or it might be in that and indifferent with like well, sixes as well. So I have a question, but we're we're using different bet sizes with different hands. Um. Yes, in, in so, general, on the river especially, this is why it's over about triple barrels on the river. Um, on the river especially, um, we can get away with using different bet sizes with the different parts of our um of our value range. But when we when we face a raise, shouldn't we just consider the hands we're using for that bet size? Yes, we don't have to worry about um anything else. Right, so, so um, if if we want to have multiple sizes and and not complicate everything by choosing a different size for every different hand, say we have a few different sizes, so we have like a, a shove, a two x pot, a pot, and like a half pot for our riverbed sizes, and then we can use that in a sim. Um, for our our two x pot, whatever values, whatever value hands which we allocate to that size, mm -hmm. we're gonna to have to fold have two thirds of that to the raise. Okay, cool, cool. So we're not comparing, and you and you can use and you can use this math to to try and allocate some hands into the two x pot size. So if you can see that s is close to two for um, some hands, then you can put those hands into two x pot. Okay, but for most, like, like a vast majority of the hands for two x, it's just going to be since we have to do like how much percent, like if we're ahead. So for two x pot, let's say, let's say we're behind only four percent of the time. Let's just speak, and I'm not quite. Let's just say four percent of the time for two x pot. Then wouldn't that hand that bets two x? Wouldn't that be the one of the only hands that bet two x? Because if it's a weaker, or stronger hand, then we're either ahead or behind. We're either ahead only four or or, or only three or um, six percent of the time. Like, like so. So if I'm betting two x to pot, yeah, yeah. it's only going to be with a certain sub, basically a specific value range. Because you know, if it's if we have stronger or weaker hands, we're going for a different bet size. Yeah, yeah. So that's that goes again to sort of this one, um, and then the, this graph, right? Your the bet size for each hand is going to be in between here, depending on how deep you are um, against a non pacified opponent. So this blue line is when you're infinitely deep, so they can shove an infinite size against you. Um, if, they, if they know exactly what's going on with your, with your hand. But um, going in between these two equations should give you a decent um, estimate as to which size you want to use. So it's a different, there's a difference between looking at the hand and then picking a bet size for it and then using that size for that hand and then bluffing according to that. That's okay against a, pass, against a point that's, that's pacified. Okay, Against a point that's pacified, you can totally get away 
with um, using this equation for all of your value, right? So you figure out what, how often your opponent beats you, and then you calculate an S star for that size for that hand, and then you use that hand at that at that size. Um, no, that's pacified. That's just pacified. Though, that's against right? a pacified opponent. I guess I guess opponent that isn't pacified, then your bet sizes are going to be um, smaller, and you're going to have to group hands together in order to protect each other. So some strong hands will protect the weaker hands, etc. Okay, so basically, so even if okay, yeah, so that's balance. And so even if um one hand prefers two x and one six x, that's six x hand. Should at a certain frequency be bet two x right to protect that? Yeah, um, with the intention of with the intention of snapping off the their shove. Okay, and it had because okay, it has to do that because if it's not in that range, then we just call it the straight. Well, it's it's, be, it's not necessarily it's not necessarily that that the six pot bet hand has to go to the two x pot hand some of the time. It's just that the the two x pot bet has to have some very stronger, much stronger hands in it to protect it. Yeah, right, yeah, so, yeah. so, so you could, yeah, you could have a hand, sense. and like that, that was the, the the pocket twos example where it was it was always shoved and not okay. used in, in any of the other sizes, right? But jacks was used in the two x pot size some of the time, um, and some other some other sets were used in a, the smaller sizes some of the time, and that's just because if the opponent raises you, you, not, can, you can you can raise on top of that, or you can call call a shove. Yeah, that's because they're not pacified. So. Whenever you're facing an opponent that isn't pacified, you can you're going to have to, and you want to use multiple bet sizes. Um, you can you can have different bet sizes, but each of those bet sizes, especially the, the non-all-in ones, um, have to be protected with some hands that can either three bet your opponent's okay. raise, etc. In, uh, in practice, we don't have to get bogged too down with that part as long as we just remember in, to. In, in just practice, you're going to play. You're, you're going to be playing against a lot of pacified opponents, opponents that aren't going to bluff raise your overbet. Okay, cool, cool. but then, like you said, if and so if you're capable, you're... so but in general, we should still just in theory, like just still throw a little pinch of. We should still throw a pinch of those. Uh, you know, our smaller bet range should still have a pinch of those really strong ones. Yeah, and those those really strong ones are gonna three bet any raise, three bet jam any okay. raise. Instead of call. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Because they have strong, to. Strong. Sorry. Okay. And that they basically are nutty. Are not like basically are nuts. Because yeah, like, yeah. if we use a if we two x, but we use a hand in our four x range instead of our six x range. That four x range should just become a call, right? Because it's not like it's not the top of our range. Even you're getting a bit, even, getting a bit of a here, but but let's let's say let's say we have the the sizes five x all in, two x and pot, right? And uh, I'll bring up the other sim just so um can get more of an idea. Um, Well, I guess we'll have to. I guess you got to do the math again to see if that uh, the non like if it's a hand that's not the nuts, if it should uh, uh, reship or not reship, but uh, you know, shove. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so this is this was the, the example. So here the uh, the different sizes. So they're the four different sizes, all in for five x, two x pot and and half pot um, in this sim. And we can see that the, um, the the like the half pot has got like a some top pairs, two pairs, and some sets, um, as well as some straights. And so if we if we bet half pot and then we get raised, um, all the all the straights and sets are going to are going to rejam, right? So the sets and the straights in the half pot range. Are, yeah, there's some two, there's some two pair in there as well. Well, two pair is is betting um, some half pot, but. Those aren't probably aren't going to. Oh yeah, here they are. They they are going to jam as well. Or if we bet pot and um, the opponent the opponent jams, you can so, snap it off with some of the sets. 
Okay, so basically, so when they're um, not pacified, you know, we definitely want to have those in there. But those, the stronger hands that we introduce into the smaller bet sizing, they're, is this like, it seems like they're always just going to reshove, like shove, uh, they're always going to re-raise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so those hands are going are gonna to be your three bet shoves. Okay, see, cool. That's what I want to know because, see, I would, those two pairs in those, some of the sets, well, no, those two pairs, I would probably just call them practice, but you're saying, like, it's showing, it's showing here that the reason why we're dropping them down is not just to protect it, but it's to ship over it. Well, that's protecting it, but it's to ship over their race. Yep. Okay, see, in practice, I would probably just call those two pairs. I would I would drop those down to the smaller size in order to call. Well, yeah, you, you can. That's what happens some of the time. So here, there's the two pair ace jack. Even with this, I mean, the set ace jack sometimes shoves, I might do it. Ace nine calls. Like the sevens. Say if I introduce sevens into that range, or I, I might flat sevens there, which would be bad. Huh? Um, yeah, sevens reships because it's got 100 percent equity in this spot. So um, you shouldn't be afraid. Oh yeah, yeah, because they're yeah because they're capped, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Duh. 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 Okay. But back to that ace. Back to the ace. Ace. Who the fuck is calling me? They keep calling me. Back to the ace. Ace. Um. Hand. The ace. Ace board. Run out. When we drop. When we introduce uh some of the really strong hands. That's not the complete. That's not the nuts. But we uh introduce some of them to the smaller bet range. Those are shoving too. Even because if they, because wouldn't there uh. Okay, yeah, yeah, because of the ASEX bluffs, huh? Yep, so you might have like an ace six, ace seven type hand betting smaller with the intention of shoving over their aces. Their their three bet. I'm sorry, their their check raise. So okay. we're three betting over their check raise. Three bet jamming and, over their check raise. And it's because they're not pacified and they're using some of the ASEXs and turning them into bluffs, right? Or, like, is it because of that? Is it, um, like, are they going to call with worse? Yeah, so, so that's when we're talking about splitting our range into this over bet and then a smaller bet size. So yeah. we might bet, we might bet like 80% pot or something with, um, with a lot of our ace X hands. And then when we face a raise, if we have some boats, we can ship with those, with those boats over the top. Okay. And expect them to call with their, um, with one of that uh, SX, which they decided to the, raise. Okay, but so with this, with the hands that they decided to turn into bluffs, are they well, the hands to... that they decided to turn to bluffs, they they have to fold them against a, a three bet because they were bluffing, right? Yeah, yeah, but okay, so okay, okay, I'm just looking. I mean, I'm not that confused. I mean, I got like almost all of it, but so when we. Okay, so they're gonna fold those asexes, which they use as bluffs. But now, when they call, aren't they just gonna call it better? Since I mean, unless we, in, like you know, since we're introducing a little bit of this and that, like yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Just... I'm not sure what you mean. So say, so say, um, on this river, you bet like half pot with like all your ace x, and then your opponent wants to check raise you with some of their stronger ace x, right? Ace x with a strong kicker, mm -hmm. and then some straights and stuff. Um, then you can use some of your strongest boats, like an ace seven okay, yeah. or an ace nine. Call, you're gonna have to call with uh, some of those uh, the straights and shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Make. Okay. I got it completely. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I just figured. Okay, because they'll get there. Okay. Okay. They're raising because we're betting half pot, so they're gonna have to. They're gonna. They're gonna definitely want to raise weaker than um. Than a boat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, perfect. That makes okay. Duh. Obviously, duh. Okay. But now, okay. So if we raise, okay. Let's. So if we raise, let's say two x, and then they uh they check raise us, we're gonna want to have some um hands that are in a bigger betting range into that range. Okay. Yes. But see, as as we go higher, it it just. Becomes less likely that they're uh, they're going to call our uh, three bet, right? Uh, I'm I'm not sure what you mean. Some of them have to call because 
threats you in um in your threat range yeah because like if we 2x the, if we 2x the um because i mean the bigger we bet on the river the stronger the raisin range becomes right because like because yep. they only have to defend yeah, they here, here they they just jam for two x support. But say, so say we two x it, and then they raise to a size which isn't a jam. So say they just click it up, uh -huh. and then for and then they're clicking it up, and then we have to think about which hands they're clicking it up with. So they're gonna so say they click it up with some boats and some straights or whatever. Um, probably not some straights because we're ripping at least a straight. Yeah. Um, but say they they click it up with some some of their boats, then we can we're obviously going to be rejamming. All of our strongest boats, so we're always <laughs> going to be rejamming like Ace Nine. Yeah. Is that okay, answer question? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh -huh. So the nuts, like literally, are the hands that are the nuts for us. Yeah, got to be. Okay, yeah. I'm just making sure I get. I just gotta. Yeah, man. Shit, yeah, man. This is. I mean, shit gets real. Yeah, it's just okay. You just gotta sprinkle. You gotta sprinkle a little bit of that. You just gotta sprinkle all that down to the smaller sizes. Sometimes, like if they're. Not pacified. Yeah. Ah, cool. I'm just yeah. I just wanted to clarify. I mean, the way you explain it and teach it, you're like, you explain it, yeah, like almost perfectly. I just want to, you know, I just want to just make sure. All right. Um. So how long have we been going for? We're going for like two and a half. <laughs> yeah. So we're going for for quite a long time now. Um. Do you want to ask? Uh, you have any? Anyone else have any questions? Um. Otherwise, we're gonna finish up. Yeah, I'm thinking. I think I had something in the back of my mind, but I was just fucking talking too much. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, I hate when I, I'll probably if it if it comes back to me, I'll probably uh just message you. But um, yeah, I think that's. Is there anything else you wanted to, or you I mean you pretty much done? Yeah, I'm done with the slides. Okay. Um. Or anything? No, that's pretty. Yeah, that's. Mm -mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. So this is gonna be okay. You obviously gonna be recording. Like I can just, yeah, we'll all be able to look at this again, right? Yep. So this is this has been recorded. I'll I'll have the the linked up to it. Oh, soon. I got a question. Um, the mentor mentee. When's uh? What's what's uh? Um, yeah. Can you uh? Give me a little info on that. Uh, what's your thoughts on like the mentor um, mentee thing? I think the group's a bit small to start that yet, but it's something that's sort of in planning. As the group gets bigger, some of the more experienced players would, would sort of just mentee some of the okay. smallest well, experienced ones. It's, it's, def it's definitely not going to be like free coaching, right? It's just going to be like, oh, here, um, I'm, I'm starting out as a live player. Do you have any advice for me? Um, and then like a, a stronger live player would would sort of just talk them through like the the whole process of of becoming like a live player or like an or like a, an online player um, who's gone through the micros recently might mentor someone coming up through the micros, just giving sort of general advice here and there. Oh. Not definitely not like a like a thing where you have to be coaching. All right, that's yeah, cool. Because I noticed there's a what sixty some members now on the on the Facebook. Yeah, it's it's getting there. Yeah, cool, cool. But it seems like there's only like, uh, yeah, because Lorenzo's a boss. He he been uh, doing this for a while, and then near me, and then um, there's a, uh, Catan, then George, me. So there's about like, I guess it seems like what eight to twelve of us that are like consistently. Well, I don't know. I just joined, so I don't know. Yeah, there's there's a few people that that are pretty active, and other people just wanna wanna watch the, the videos. Um, and I I don't mind that. If if like I I run these um these tutorials to get as many people interested um as possible and if they want to learn something they can yeah. come and ask a question about it straight away. Uh, cool cool um yeah I don't really no do you have any advice as far as um like how obviously because I mean. I mean, I'm trying to uh, do this. I mean, I did it a little bit before. I did live a little bit for a while, for a couple of years. But like, I started playing online a couple of years ago. Like, do you have any advice for um, you know, just 
I guess going through the grind or any like the process as far as I don't know, I guess because because you work a full time. I mean, you're real busy. So how would you because I work 40 hours a week. So do you have any advice for? Well, you, you got GTA Plus, so you can use GTA Plus to just run Sims on your computer while you're at work. And then you look at them when you get home. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. All oh, right, yeah, because basically, because what I've been doing, I, I would play, like, I try to play at least, like, at least, like, a couple thousand hands a week. Because, I mean, I just, I play on ACR, I play four tables, and I only see about two to three hundred hands an hour. And I'll play, like, probably a couple hours a day just on the weekdays. Weekends, I'll try to play a little more. And then I just review and analyze my marked hands. And then, yeah, I guess, GTO, I put it in there and then look at the tree and all that. Yep, so you can you can use GTO the, the database feature. Okay. Um, how do you how do you feel about uh looking into like the databases as far as um population tendencies and trying to exploit that? Because I feel like So so here here so here in GTO if you go if you go run solver and then advanced and then you can activate database mode and then you can oh. put in you can put in a bunch of different different flops and then run them using the same tree or you can Look at one flop and then run, run different trees, mm -hmm. and then you just click start and, and you just click process database, and then it, it processes all the hands in that database. Oh, from a PT from Poker Tracker 4? No, no, no. Um, this is in GTO Plus where you set up different flops with the same tree with the same pre flop ranges, and then it, it solves all those different flops. Okay, so if you, if you had to, to, um, if you had a few different spots you want to look at, you can queue them up in GTO Plus and then run them all when you're at work and then look at them all when you get home. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, because I was... Okay. And then for my... Uh, like the player pool... Because I was seeing something, some guy... Uh, I think his name's like Nick... I think Nick Howard. He has like a, a little thing that where it's like Pio Solver. He'll look at that compared to like the database of whatever like site you're playing on and then you'll see how they're the polls deviating from Pio suggestions. Yeah, okay. I know, think um, um what um Lorenzo did, did you have something to come about this? I think um it's called the night vision it's called night vision. Like it's a product. Uh, like I yeah, look at I, it. I, I haven't seen that. Anyway, um, Katen is going to be probably going to be running our next open teaching session, um, and he's going to talk a bit about specifically like micro stakes, um, micro stakes exploits, um, and node locking. Okay. Um, in GTO Plus. Okay. Um, the node lock, and that's what. And trying to, that's find, what... trying to find trying to find good good exploits for, um player pool tendencies in the micros. So he's going to he's going to have a, a talk on that probably near okay. the end of this month. So just okay. uh, just wait just wait for that. Okay, cool. And that could just be extrapolated to like mid stakes and high stakes even though there's going to be like less leaks. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, cool, cool. All right, well, hey man, I appreciate it, man. This was a uh, this was pretty dope. I learned uh, quite a few things. But basically it's not so much learning new things, it's just the clarity on just the already, you know, mentioned concepts for like through the years, shit. <laughs> but definitely. Yeah, all right. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I'm about to, like to hey, come together. Oh, I'm gonna check out. I'm gonna check out those forex. Uh, I'm gonna check out those forex charts. Uh, is, is this over? Could we still talk and this be ended? Yeah, right. I'll I'll turn off the the recording now. All right. Um. Thanks for watching. If if you're watching this. After 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 it's over. Thanks for watching. Returning for the recording.